in great pleasure to take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt appreciation on sir your audio is missing sir let me repeat again good morning to all of you am i audible yes yes it's honor and great pleasure to welcome dignitaries who very kindly accepted our invitation at a very short notice and kindly agreed to share their experience in the field of COVID-19. Thanks, sirs. Needless to say, the emergence of rapid spread of COVID-19 has led to about 183 million confirmed cases and nearly 4.1 million deaths worldwide as on date. No other pathogen has attracted to the extent global attention of medical professionals, scientists, sociologists, psychologists, even anthropologists. Regarding its pathogenesis, management, treatment, and prediction of its likely authors. Further, no other disease has created globally mass confusion, be its origin, efficacy of vaccines, waning of antibodies, efficacy and duration of T-cell responses, and role of other players of immune orchestra medicines and post-COVID complications, etc. Today in this awareness series program, organized by NASI headquarters and NASI Pune chapter, we have distinguished experts who, who would not only enlighten us with their thought-provoking knowledge in the field, ranging from SARS-CoV-2 variants, new normal etiquettes, vaccines, COVID-19 in children, but way beyond. Once again, I welcome you all in the awareness series program for COVID-19 Azadi Ka Mosa. Hope, Nasi's efforts and approach would help to enable development of a set of priorities that could transform future research and knowledge-based growth to mitigate the fight against this deadly disease. Thank you all once again. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your time sending a very warm welcome to everyone and giving the glimpses of the pandemic situation and how it was dealt with the government, the healthcare workers and uh, the scientists. So thank you so much. Awareness is the key for tackling the health crisis. National Academy of Sciences India, the oldest science academy of this country, started a nationwide campaign, Jagrupta Abhiyan for the COVID-19 pandemic in the year 2020 immediately after the announcement made by our Honorable Prime Minister. This initiative was executed under the overall guidance and chairmanship of Honorable Madam Dr. Manju Sharmaji, Nasi DST Distinguished Women Scientist Chair, former Secretary to the Government of India and Chairperson Nasi Ju Initiative, who truly deserves the credit for making concerted efforts to implement this program and Nasi is very much thankful for her major contributions and valuable guidance. Today she is with us and very, I am very much honored to invite her 
madam needs no introduction just to uh, introduce her formally i would like to say that she has played a very significant role in establishing several institutions in the country she was the president of the national academy of sciences india and also the indian national congress association she is well recognized for her manifold significant contributions particularly for the welfare of women who regard her as a role model she earlier served as the secretary department of biotechnology in the ministry of science and technology government of india and was most recently the president and executive director at the indian institute of advanced research in gandhinagar gujarat she is still very active as the advisor of nasi guru initiative and also as bsc women scientist chair professor in the national academy of sciences india she has been honored with numerous awards and she has received lifetime achievement award from by spectrum and was awarded the padma bhushan by the government of india in 2007 she also received the lifetime achievement award for human service in biotechnology from reva university bangalore and lifetime achievement award 2009 in 2019 by society for ethnopharmacology india ma'am we request you to please say a few words and give your blessing thank you achna a warm good morning to all and namaskar to everybody uh, i also want to extend a very warm welcome as uh, already dr mishra has said but uh, once again i welcome all of you including dr mishra and thank you so much for organizing this uh, under the punya chapter this program as uh, achna has already mentioned the national academy of sciences is one of the oldest of the science academy with a mandate uh, science and society it has got several programs uh, of science and technology intervention which have been organized all over the country uh, once uh, the honorable prime minister uh, announced the uh, program uh, on this opposition uh, ma in september and then later in october about the jagrukta abhiyan for covid 19 and appropriate behavior uh, nasi immediately uh, with the help of the president and uh, all the nasi staff and fellows and council members decided to launch a series of webinars all over the country you know nasi can't make a very big effort but it can make a small effort and that has also paid very rich dividends uh, as far as the kuposhan ma is concerned uh, prime minister has also said that uh, now this september month again uh, the whole country is observing this kuposhan ma uh, as per the global hunger index india is 102 uh, out of 117 nations so we really really need to do something on the kuposhan and uh, very soon we'll be starting uh, another we have already launched six programs but very soon we'll be starting more of the kuposhan program in different parts of the country with the help of the nasi local chapters regarding jagrukta abhiyan Uh, you know, the president of our uh, the founder president of the academy uh, professor meghnath saha made a beautiful statement and i want all of you to know that what he said at that time that was in 1930 is relevant today also he said an academy of science can do a great deal by educating public opinion undertaking particular problems and bringing out scientific workers in various fields for discussion and cooperative research that is the result of uh, you know the cooperative research uh, between uh, let us say here in this case niv and the industry today con the country is so very proud of uh, rolling out a vaccine which is being used or nationally and also internationally to a great extent thank you priya for your very good contribution we must all recognize a woman scientist doing so good work okay 
So what uh, Sir Meghna Saha said, but the main function of the academy should be towards cultural improvement by contributions to human knowledge. And we have seen that in spite of the best efforts government is making for spreading the message about the appropriate behavior for COVID-19 pandemic, wearing of the mask, maintaining the social distancing, and also uh, washing hands with soap regularly at frequent intervals. In spite of the message, uh, not only NASI, but so many organizations, government, they are spreading it on a large scale. Still, we feel that uh, both the wearing of the mask and social distancing, they have not been followed properly. Otherwise, the cases would not be rising so rapidly as we see today. Uh, every day, although we want to, we, we know that uh, there is a little decrease in the number of cases as far as the second wave is concerned, but uh, we can't be complacent because uh, all the medical experts are saying, and we will hear from them today, that uh, the, you know, the likelihood of the third wave, uh, you cannot rule out. Therefore, the appropriate behavior is very, very important. And that requires a cultural change. What we feel is the moment we see markets open, there is a huge crowd there and just rubbing each other with the shoulders. So there is no uh, social distancing. Most of the time, the ladies will take off the mask and put it in the neck only. So these are all the things which we have to take note of. And NASI is trying to uh, spread this message through these webinars amongst the students so that the students become the ambassadors to go and spread the message further in the society, in the families. But we are also trying to go to the rural areas. And along with the Indian Council of Medical Research, NASI has started a very, very good program. Uh, which is uh, uh, going into the rural areas, me getting, spreading the message about vaccination, removing the vaccine hesitancy, uh, uh, you know, uh, psyche, psyche of the people, and trying to see that uh, maximum number of women, children, uh, men, they get vaccinated. And this NASI ICMR program is also on the Jagarukta Abhiyan, and we are doing it in four states and a num large number of villages we have spread this program. Uh, NASI's efforts have uh, covered more than 20,000 populations so far, and even more, I think Archana would know the exact numbers. But uh, at the same time, uh, we are trying to spread the program as much as possible. You know, this particular program, we invite uh, excellent public health workers, uh, we invite the doctors, we invite the professionals, uh, university people, medical colleges, research organizations, etc., etc. They talk about the development of drugs, uh, therapeutics, vaccines, and masks. Uh, nobody misses the whole question of masks because uh, still today the people feel, and I'm sure all my experts here, they will tell us that ma mass is still so very essential for the prevention of and spread of corona epidemic. Uh, the last point I want to say here, because we want to listen to all the excellent professionals who have gathered here. So the last point uh, what I want to mention here is that, uh, you know, what happens is that uh, very soon uh, we, we, we start thinking that now we have, we have achieved uh, uh, almost all our targets, for example, the vaccination target or the coverage to in the rural areas or cover, com completing the women's score because women's were scoring less uh, as far as the vaccination is concerned. Very soon we become very complacent and say, now we have almost achieved all our targets. So we slow down. I think we have to constantly remind us there is no time for us to slow down. 
we have to continue to be as alert as possible as we were in the beginning of the second wave or in the middle of the second wave and also we have to remember that the still very large population is to be sensitized is the awareness has yeah. to be created among them, and they have to be vaccinated so the, with these words i want to uh, welcome all the experts who have accepted our invitation and uh, i will request them to give their lectures thank you Thank you so much, ma'am, for your words of wisdom. We are very much thankful to you for all your support and major contributions to NASI, due to which NASI could reach such heights, and we look forward to your kind blessings. The National Academy of Sciences India, NASI, has traveled a long journey in communicating science to the people of society. It would not have been possible without the support of its past presidents. Professor G. Mm -hmm. Padman mm -hmm. sir. Contributed a lot to NASI, especially uh, during the year 2020 when he addressed the society through his uh, various uh, issues on COVID 19 pandemic and enlightened the masses. He needs no introduction, but just to introduce him formally, I would say he is a renowned biochemist and biotechnologist. He was the former director of Indian Institute of Science and past president of NASI, and presently he serves as honorary professor in the Department of Biochemistry at Indian Institute of Science. He was instrumental in assuring the recombinant DNA technology in the country and worked closely with government agencies to further the cause of biotechnology in the country. He helped and promote, promoted vaccine industries in the country and contributed in the development of recombinant hepatitis. D vaccine and DNA rabies vaccine, as well as showing the anti malaria property of curcumin and its efficacy in combination therapy in 2004. He is the recipient of several prestigious awards, including Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan from the Government of India, Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award for Science and Technology, and Jawaharlal Nehru Bird Sanitary Fellowship of INSA, to name a few. We are going to listen to him very shortly. This uh, uh, presentation, uh, you know, due to difficult uh, circumstances, uh, I'm not able to be present uh, tomorrow. Um, Professor Gatak, uh, President Nasi, Dr. Manju Sharma, and Dr. Gyan Mishra, and distinguished colleagues, uh, it's indeed a great privilege for me to be making this uh, presentation. Uh, in uh, thank Dr. Mishra for inviting me, and we are all indebted to Dr. Manju Sharma for putting so much effort to take the message of NASI to the society. And Jagrita Abhyan is only one other example. Today, I will spend uh, the next 10 minutes on the virus. In the past, I have had occasion in these webinars to talk about other aspects of the disease. But I thought I should spend some time talking about the virus itself. Because we talk about lineages, we talk about variants, and these are all coming from sequencing the genome. And, uh, you know, these are important medically because they will help us to track the disease to track severity, you know, hospitalization, and many parameters. But the question is, what does it mean to the virus? For example, it is known that this virus will mutate one or two mutations per month. This means if you have 30,000 infections, so there are 30,000 minimally viral particles. And you can imagine the number of changes that can take place. And in fact, the uh, reviews say when the pandemic is over, we will have hundreds and thousands of sequences. 
But fortunately, what is happening, most of these changes are detrimental to the virus itself. The virus does not replicate, so you don't see them. So what you actually see is the few, uh, you know, uh, alpha variant, beta variant, gamma variant, delta variant. And within delta, you have now AY1 to AY25. And the classification allows uh, something like 100 such, uh, such variations, actually. But uh, what it means uh, to the virus, this is the question. I have shown you in this slide um, the structure of the spike protein. And we all know it is a spike protein that binds to the uh, uh, ACE receptor on the host cell, say lung, lung cell. Now the virus, the spike protein consists of uh, two subunits, S1 subunit and S2 subunit. What is not well known probably is that the spike protein is decorated with glycans. Glycans means sugars. The sugar molecules are covering the surface of the spike protein and therefore there is a concern, for example, that antibodies may not access the protein. The sugars may prevent it. But there's a small region here, which is which you don't see the brown or the sugar. And that is the one that is the receptor binding domain. And that is one that binds to the yes 2 receptor. Actually, it is sitting on glycans. And it has been shown if this glycan is mutated, the RBD will collapse. That means the virus cannot infect. Therefore, you know, this will become a drug target. But we still do not know how to access this uh, sugar molecules here. Now, S1, S2, S1 is the one that is binding to the uh, S2 receptor. And if you carefully look, this is a trimeric protein. There are three strands in this uh, spike protein. And then it has a small hinge region. Uh, between S1 and S2. And what happens is this has to be cleaved by a serine protease. A transmembrane serine protease that is called as Tempres2 or Cathepsin. If it is Cathepsin, it will go through the endosome route. If it is serine protease, it will not go through the endosome route. Um, that is where the uh, uh, previous slide you saw, the hinge region that is that has to be cleaved by uh, either the serine protease or the cathepsin. And then this, uh, no, we can go forward. We are, uh, next slide we can go. And then this allows exposure of aromatic amino acids on the spike protein. And the S2 integrates with the host membrane. This is what is happening. So, S1 is the one that will bind to the uh, receptor. Then, cleaving between the hinge, the hinge region and then S2 will now integrate with the host membrane. And that is what, you, uh, once it has done, it becomes like a zipper or somebody is crouching to jump. This is what is happening and then the RNA is thrown out into the cell, into the host cell. So, after binding, the RNA is thrown into the host cell and the RNA starts translating. For example, sorry, this is, this is one. The RNA starts translating, the RNA will give rise to proteins. Now, there are something like 29 proteins, uh, you have non-structural proteins, most of them, and four structural proteins. Spike protein is one structural protein. We do not know much about this non-structural protein. NSP1, for example, is supposed to shut down host protein synthesis. This is what the virus does. Once it is inside, it is shutting off the host protein synthesis. By 70% and 30% remaining is all viral protein synthesis. So this is what the virus does. So the host protein synthesis is shut off, the host messenger RNA is degraded, and the viral proteins are formed, and then, you know, it will 
form more RNA and then virus will start assembly. And again, there is an interesting feature. The assembly is taking place inside the endoplasmic reticulum. We know endoplasmic reticulum is a reticular structure. But here, what is happening, the virus is converting it into a double membrane vesicle. So, it is hiding inside the double membrane vesicle. So, it is high affinity entry and then once inside, it hides. It hides inside the endoplasmic reticulum. The, the, it will form envelope, uh, membrane protein, all you know, the spike protein. All these uh, non-structural proteins, viral assembly is taken place. Then there will be a pore in the endoplasmic reticulum, and the, through the pore, the virus will come out. Now the virus is getting ready for the exit. How does it exit the cell? It forms. This is known for all coronaviruses. It will exit through Golgi. Golgi is again a, a network, but here you see a bubble is formed. And inside the bubble, you see the virus. This is Golgi. And the Golgi integrates with the host membrane and it is ejected out. But there is a very interesting phenomenon that is taking place. Now it is cleaved by a protease called a furin, furin, which is a host protein. I earlier told you about serine protein cleavage, protease cleavage for entry. Now I am telling about furin. Furin cleavage is necessary, apparently, for the serine protease to cleave. They are all within, you know, inside the syringe region. That's what they are doing. And this is known as the priming. That what is priming? Essentially, it is cleavage by the furin. And furin cleavage facilitates serine protease cleavage. So, I presented the virus entering through serine protease cleavage, but once it has gone inside the cell and it has come out prime, without furin cleavage, it cannot be cleaved by serine protease. It will be only using the endosome root and catepsin, and it is a slow process. And that is what is happening in SARS-1. We will use the word SARS-1. In SARS-2, it is essentially the serine protease that is cleaving and for which you need the furin cleavage. Now, interestingly, once the virus is out, it will start infecting other cells because it is not primed. Priming, you know, interestingly, is only 10% in SARS-1. In SARS-2, priming is 50%. Let me repeat what is priming. Priming is Cleaving with full fury followed by serine protease and activating the S2, basically. What we are talking about in the exit strategy. Now, when the cells are primed, the SARS-2 priming is 50%, 50%. In alpha variants, apparently it is more than 50%. In delta variant, it is more than 75%. That is probably the reason why Delta variant is more transmissive. And the cleavages will happen at the site arginine site, where there is an arginine. Ar there is only around you know, 681, let's uh, say, number. So, simple so arginine, uh, SARS-1. There are three arginines for SARS-2. The basic environment facilitates better cleavage, better priming. So why SARS-2 is more effective than SARS-1? This is this proposal that is made. Priming is more. And in the Delta variant, as I said, priming is more than 75%. And another interesting feature is once the virus comes out, you will see the surface. The spike protein is not only in the virus, it is also on the host cell. Now, if the spike protein is on the host cell surface, you imagine one host cell can interact with another host cell, which expresses ACE2 receptor. So, this forms a chain. One host cell 
and interacting with another host cell, with another host cell, and another host cell. And this phenomenon is known as syncytia, syncytia formation. So, uh, this is where, you know, uh, basic biology of the virus, I have presented it as if everything is known. It is not true. There are many, many open questions. These are all based on hypotheses, and uh, some are experiments, some are just hypotheses. You know, so modeling. So a lot of work needs to be done. For example, does the virus use the endosome? Does the virus use the only the serine protease? Does the virus use the endosome for exit or for entry? How does it develop inside the endoplasmic reticulum? You know, there are many, many questions which are not answered. The answer will only come if we look at the virus, not necessarily in culture. You know, culture alone will not give you the answer because some cultures apparently, apparently give you the endosome. That means it's a slow process. It's also an interesting explanation. The controversy, you know, hydroxychloroquine acts, acts, doesn't act. If endosome involved, chloroquine will accumulate. If endosome is not involved, chlorocene will not act. So if it is a serine protease, no chloroquine is involved. If endosome is involved, then chloroquine is involved. As you know, there is a controversy whether hydroxychloroquine acts and doesn't act. There are clinicians who are still using hydroxychloroquine. So we need to understand the science. I am saying this, I spent time today you know, the, on the high affinity entry. Once inside the virus will hide itself, exit, once it exits, it infects more cells because it has got primed. Therefore, we need to understand a lot more about this virus. If you have to design a new drug, for example, the review stay, we, have, we don't really have a drug which is specific for SARS virus. People are using whatever is available on the shelf, which means drugs which was work for HIV, Drugs which work for other coronaviruses are being tested. We don't have a drug which is specific for SARS-1. So these are two ends. Therefore, we need a knowledge, intense knowledge of this biology of this virus. This is not just basic research, it's very, very important. While the lineages, variants, they are all very important clinically to understand uh, that we need a drug, perhaps even to design a new vaccine. We need a knowledge of how the virus enters, how the virus replicates, how the virus assembles, and how the virus exits, and how does the get primed, and how is it infecting new cells. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for a very nice, uh, uh, very rich talk. I hope on the I hope it will be useful normally. Very much useful, sir, because it is based uh, on your hypothesis as well as the basic facts of the science, especially you have uh, pointed out the role of the glycans and the gel system, which is responsible for making the intricacies, but how it works and how it should be correlated with the intricacies of entering into the uh, normal cell and then leaving it to prepare it in the other cells, that is very important, sir, and that you try to uh, make it clear to us. It is very knowledgeable talk, sir. We are very much thankful to you, sir. Very much thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank, thank you, Arsina. I think it's wonderful. You know, you saved me. <laughs> Otherwise, I was wondering. Arjuna ji, Arjuna ji will like to. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your valuable insight on this very important subject. and. We heartily thank you for sparing your precious time in spite of your other commitments. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Archana. Thank you, Niris. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we are very much grateful to Honorable Sir, Professor Pradhanavan, sir, for sparing his time and enlightening us. May I now request Professor G.C. Misha, sir, to please say a few words on this, um, make a few comments. 
I think I have already welcomed and spoken what I wanted to speak. However, what sir has said, perhaps in mad rush of translational science, his words will go a long way. We need to understand biology. We also need not everything put on sequencing. Endless job. I personally, as a director of NCCS, only promoted basic science. So therefore, my heart will always remain in the basic science. Thanks. Thank you, sir, for sharing your remarks. Now, COVID-19 pandemic has drastically changed the way we live, the way we think, we work, we act, or even the way we behave. The experts are of the opinion that the pandemic is going to be with us for many more years. So we need to adopt certain new practices, new methods, new ways, and make it as part of our life. Now we have with us Dr. Priya Brahmji, who is going to enlightening us on very interesting topics. New normal etiquettes have come to stay. Professor Priya Brahmji is the director of ICMR National Institute of Virology at Pune. Earlier, she was the head of department of clinical virology at Christian Medical College, Vellore. She took over as director of India's FX laboratory with expertise in virology just two months before the first COVID case was detected in India. Since then, the Pune-based NIV, which is at the forefront of India's battle with coronavirus, successfully isolated the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the month of March and recently developed the indigenous antibody detection kit for COVID-19 used to determine the spread in the country and also the COVID-19 vaccine under her leadership. We request you, ma'am, to please enlighten us. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your kind words, and I'm honored to be part of the Jagrita Abhiyan for COVID-19 pandemic. Respected Professor Manju Sharma, President of NASI, Professor Gadak, and other esteemed uh, office bearers of NASI, and my fellow scientists. My talk is going to be a departure from uh, the basic uh, biology or pathogenesis of the virus but I'm going to emphasize on what is going to become the new normal for us today. Here, I hope to not just stress on the COVID appropriate behavior, but also to reflect on some changes in our lifestyle, which will help us to cope with the ongoing pandemic, as well as attempt to ward off pandemics and outbreaks in the future. So, as uh, we all know, the world has been furiously trying to vaccinate. And as of yesterday, 5.48 billion doses have been administered over, uh, in over 183 countries. India herself has delivered about 687 million vaccine doses thus far. And we know COVID-19 vaccines are effective and are a critical tool to bring the pandemic under control. However, we know that no vaccine, no vaccine thus far uh, ever made is 100% effective at preventing infection. And we know when we look at the gamut of uh, COVID vaccines we have today, they vary in their efficacy from 70 to 90%. And that is why probably India, like other countries, has reported breakthrough infections. Now, what features about the virus cause breakthrough infections? And uh, Dr. Padmanabhan sir also already alluded to some of the uh, pathogenic features of the virus, particularly the Delta variant and its uh, evolving sublineages. We know this uh, variant is much more contagious with an R0 of almost approximately 8.5 as per CDC. Today, if we look at an overall consensus, 
the average R0 of this virus is 7. So if we look at a virus uh, uh, which has even a basic R0 of 2, as you can see here, when an individual sneezes, coughs, speaks, or even sings, if I may say so, we, uh, uh, that infected individual actually can infect two people straight off, and that individual uh, amongst those two, they can infect two more, and so on. And you can see how many people are infected from one person who is, um, uh, you know, shedding virus by speaking, coughing, uh, sneezing, etc. This is with an R0 of 2, and you can imagine when we have an, even an average R0 of 7 for the Delta variant, how quickly the virus can spread. It, the virus replicates or multiplies even faster in the replica, uh, respiratory tract, this particular variant. Uh, we know that in those who are immunized, the achieved virus loads are likely to be lower, but still individuals can transmit infection. We also know that there's some reduction of antibody binding of this Delta variant in vaccines. We also know that uh, they are the major cause of breakthrough infections. However, in most who are immunized, there is reduced hospitalization and death. We know that in those who are unimmunized, there can be a, a much higher risk of an adverse outcome. So based on the data that uh, came out of ICMR and its VRDL network, uh, we, uh, whole genome analysis of breakthrough cases during the second wave from 17 states and union territories of India was sent to NIV Pune. And out of 511 whole genome sequences that we got a very good coverage of, 86.7% of them were actually the Delta variant. About 9.8% required hospitalization, but a very adverse outcome, such as case fatality or death, occurred in only 0.4%. So clearly we can see the benefit of um, vaccination uh, breakthrough, as, uh, is the, uh, uh, as it is defined, is the positivity either by RT-PCR or antigen testing in an individual who has been completely vaccinated by, with two doses uh, 14 days after taking the second dose. Now, to tell you about the variants that have, uh, you know, swept through our globe, you can see when we started with uh, uh, Gisade clades like L, O, S, and V, this is overtaken by a much more transmissible version uh, known as the G clade and subclades thereof. And this is the alpha variant. And at your far right is none else than the Delta variant. And you can see the Delta variant has really hogged the, um, the stage uh, in almost edging out every other variant because of its higher transmissibility. And even in India, of course, this is a classification based on pangolin, but uh, and uh, the concomitant Gisset classifications are also there. All of them belong to the G clade and subclades thereof. And what you see here again in dark green, uh, olive green, is the Delta variant. This is the Alpha variant. And we have had other uh, variants of concern also sweeping different nations. But we will know. We can see that variants will come. Earlier variants may subside and may be taken over by variants that have a greater capacity to uh, transmit and spread. Now, will there be more variants? Yes, this is an RNA virus. They will try to keep moving. The virus will keep try, uh, try to keep moving from one person to another to sustain itself. And as it spreads, it will undergo small changes. And if we allow it to spread, it is going to continue to have make these small mutations and form variants. So the, the key feature here is to prevent spread of the virus. And we have two powerful weapons in our hands that can stop its spread. The mask, which uh, can thwart any variant thus far. It respects no variant. And we somehow tend to underestimate its power and its capabilities. And of course, we have the vaccine. 
So let me now drift into the new normal where I would reflect on some of the changes we need to bring into our lives uh, so that we can cope with the pandemic uh, better and brace ourselves for the future. So we know as schools reopen, uh, 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 changes have occurred. Students, uh, 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 it is not mandatory for students to be physically present and their, uh, their attending has to be um, after parental consent. There's compulsory mask wearing. Thermal screening is done on entry. 50% students per classroom, staggered lunch breaks, alternate seating arrangements. And now there is a massive drive in our country to vaccinate our teachers. Do we shake hands? No, that's not at all on. And um, um, while youngsters may choose to greet each other differently, I do believe in a more formal setting, our traditional graceful namaste cannot be more appropriate in these times. In the hospital setting, we have seen that our healthcare professionals have endured extreme work conditions and sacrifices to help uh, the infected as they came in. Many have faced burnt out, many have suffered burnout, sorry, many have faced burnout, some have suffered post-traumatic stress disorders, and unfortunately, some have succumbed. The uh, figures, uh, unofficial figures, are that at least 115,000 healthcare workers have succumbed to this infection. So in the era of our new normal, healthcare workers need to remember that even when you're not treating patients who are suspected to have COVID, the risk remains. Healthcare workers need to remain vigilant, protect themselves uh, and um, assume practices that would keep them safe. Uh, we can see here where healthcare workers, one typical risky situation is when uh, healthcare workers come together in the canteen or cafeteria, they doff their masks and they're sitting together and enjoying a meal with a lot of mirth and laughter. But what is recommended is they don't sit next to each other but keep a good distance as they take off their mask to consume their meal. Frequent san uh, hand sanitization and also uh, frequently disinfecting commonly touched surfaces, doorknobs, uh, you know, apparatus that you may touch, the work table, um, your stethoscope, etc., need to be constantly uh, disinfected. So, what is the plan for the future in the healthcare sector? More investment is required for building more resilient healthcare systems uh, in our country. We have seen that countries like Germany that had robust health infrastructure had lower death rates. We need to empower our healthcare workers through training and build a pipeline of workers um, um, for the future. The world actually needs an estimate of 6 million more nurses by 2030. Inadequate safety in the healthcare work environment uh, has been one reason why many of our uh, healthcare workers have fallen prey to this virus and need to provide them enough uh, personal protective equipment and also protect them from the physical, um, um, uh, you know, attacks that some of our healthcare workers and doctors have faced by irate patients' relatives during the peak of the second wave. We need to support them psychologically and also help to form um, uh, teams with preparedness and planning and have good response teams in place, bracing ourselves for the future. There has been a shift in the point of care. The pandemic has prompted us to um, uh, foray into using digital solutions. Telemedicine's use has skyrocketed. Several digital apps have helped people during this pandemic, and there are zillions of assorted apps for better efficiency, even for meditation, sports, and for finance. We need to delve into these options. Telepharmacy has boomed immensely, and the use of digital stethoscopes, uh, portable ECG monitors, digital autoscopes, digital sensors have all become very popular, and we probably need to embrace the use of these especially in the home care setting. There's also been a shift in the point of care where there are drive-through doctor clinics, 
home visits for doctors. This is again to minimize exposure for the patient. What we have seen globally is that the digital health network has extensively used artificial intelligence and this will become a necessary tool of the future. The AI platform has assisted in sending out the first alerts of the outbreak. Algorithms were used to help screen those who are potentially affected. AI helped hospitals in managing their resources. It even helped to speed up vaccine research and drug discovery. It assisted in uh, 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 using uh, medical decisions, coming to medical decisions, and in analyzing the ever increasing volume of medical information and research information that we have accrued in these past 19 odd months. When coming to the pandemic in the family, we need to keep uh, in mind that being homebound has had different effects on individuals at different ages particularly children and adolescents have found this uh, restrictive to some extent. And this needs to be borne in mind and we need to provide the psychosocial support that they need because of the lack of peer interaction. Family photos, unfortunately, may be begin to look like this in the future. Family reunions may, may come to be mostly virtual also in the future. While we are homebound, working from home, interacting from home, being at home at law, for, for long lengths of time, mental, physical, and emotional well-being has to be taken into account. We need to practice mindfulness and ways of stress, stress relief. Another important facet that I would like to impress on is that while individual, while um, a, uh, patients were admitted in the hospital and especially during the peaks of the pandemic. These patients were unable to have visitors, particularly their family visiting. For many, the pandemic afflicted the inability to even say a goodbye to their loved ones and friends. And to ameliorate this, several hospitals have now started providing electronic tablets, which will give an opportunity for patients to connect with their families and loved ones. This, I feel, is a very powerful way of communicating for the patient to stay positive, to stay connected with her, her, his or her family. And we must attempt to make this available to all patients, no matter what their background. With the upcoming festive uh, season and wedding season later in the year in our country, we need to avoid the three C's, crowded places, close contact settings, and confined and enclosed spaces. This is inevitable in, as part of uh, the usual celebrations, and we must consciously keep in mind that we must stay away from the, these three C's, which are big uh, and potentially super spreader uh, um, uh, events. Avoid unnecessary travel. Spitting in public spaces, which is still very much rampant in our society, must be strictly banned because it might leave traces of the virus. And I love this cartoon which says, if I see you spit, be sure I won't quit. We need to also, many of us over the course of the day, subconsciously uh, touch different parts of our face. And uh, that has been a practice which never really uh, was considered a, a risky. But today we need to consciously remember that we should avoid touching our face, rubbing or touching our eyes, nose or mouth. It may be a good idea to always have a sanitizer with you in your uh, bag. And remember, these actions really start with us we have to start playing the part. When we are sick or not feeling um, up to it, the best is to report to our colleagues and our authorities, stay home, uh, monitor, and seek urgent medical care if needed. As I had said, avoid touching one's face. Um, we need to observe the typical cough etiquette where we cough into our elbows. 
keep our hands clean. Remember to keep that one meter distance and then uh, sanitize all that we touch. I want to take a few minutes about mask wearing. And I, I really feel very strongly about this because even when I have been traveling over this pandemic, particularly this year, even when we look at people who are seemingly uh, educated, affluent, you expected to be well informed, very few of them wear the mask properly. Some of the deviations of mask wearing, which one we would see if we were to step out, the escape hatch where people have made a little uh, aperture here in the mask for them to consume liquid. Some might just take it off and hang it by their ear. It's dubbed as the earring. Many, many, many people actually become sniffers because the mask is there to only cover their mouth. Their entire nose is outside the mask. Some may actually don it like a mustache between nose and mouth for what good uh, really escapes me. Some might use it as a nose plug covering the nose but the mouth is exposed. And then of course, another common violation is the neck uh, beard or what might even call the chin mask because the mask is around the chin and not covering the essential parts of the face. Uh, um, along with mask wearing, of course, is the keeping of physical distance and sanitizing, which I already saw. So let let us remind ourselves, it is I and you break the chain of this virus transmission. We need to reflect on us as um, citizens of this planet and the pandemic. And today we can reflect to see that humankind more than ever before should stand together. We need to work together to tackle increasing rates of pollution and climate change. It is a top global security and our response needs to match this because all of this contributes to the emergence of uh, new viruses, new microbes, which were quiescent in other um, niches in our planet. The interaction and the epidemiological relationship between climate changes, environmental and ecosystem disturbances, exposure to vectors, and spread of infectious disease has become so much more obvious to us today. We need a collective and an inclusive response. We have witnessed firsthand that viruses do not respect borders. A global problem like a pandemic requires global solutions. We are not safe unless everyone is safe. There has to be collaborative effort to attain optimal health for humans animals and the environment. The pandemic is a reminder of the intimate and delicate relationship between all the citizens of the planet uh, and uh, the planet itself. Every effort to make our world safer is doomed to fail unless they address the critical interface between people and pathogens and the existential threat of climate change that is making our earth less habitable. I quote Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, the Director General of the World Health Organization. And if you were asking, when will this pandemic end? Again, I quote this great man. The pandemic will end when the world chooses to end it. It is in our hands. Um, we celebrated Teachers Day two days ago, and you may have seen this being forwarded to you on WhatsApp. And I thought it was really powerful. The best teacher of the year award goes to COVID-19. It has taught us what life is about, simplicity and spirituality, but there is an element of uncertainty. So with this, thank you for your patient listening. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your expertise on various aspects of COVID pandemic. Most importantly, how the measures taken to contain the virus have reshaped our everyday etiquettes and which we call a new normal that has to be followed if we want to combat the virus and with the take-home message, 
you have rightly said that it all depends it's all our choice how we deal with the virus so thank you so much for joining us now bringing a new vaccine from lab to people is a very long process right from its development to clinical trials then uh, and uh, manufacturing development everything now we have our next lecture which is to be delivered by dr sanjay singh ji who is going to speak on covid-19 vaccine research and development dr sanjay singh ji serves as the director and chief executive officer of genova biopharmaceuticals limited he has also worked with national institute of health usa he has several years of experience in the area of vaccines and biopharmaceuticals he has been on the board of companies in 2006 Prior to starting the company in 2006, he worked as the head of antigen development section of the Malaria Vaccine Development Branch at the National Institute of Health, USA. Sir, we request you to please deliver your lecture and enlighten us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Misra and Nasi for inviting me for this such a important uh, occasion. and uh, i need permission to uh, upload my my presentation can it be possible it is given yes sir yes sir you can uh, you can share your slides from your end sir uh, somehow i am not getting that permission sir please press the share button third uh, from this side yes you have to press the share button sir it is not responding somehow to me the share button so yeah hai so um somebody is working on it so i can start in between um kaun se kaun dusre computer se load kare Uh, now I think it is responding. So I may go for a second out, and then I will be back. So now it has responded. It has approved. Yes sir it's visible now. Uh, can you hear me also? Yes sir. Okay thank you sorry for this confusion because uh, so looks like our computer systems are uh, under too much of threat so lot of controls has been put so <laughs> even i cannot going thank you. So uh, when i was invited by dr misra so i thought little bit i should talk about this overall r&d effort and what mrna vaccine we are doing into it so going forward so we have different type of vaccine platforms available today and from different platforms vaccine has also been been available and why we have chosen mrna vaccine what we are doing and not only today what problems we are having because of mutation and all these kind of things so whether this is this platform technology going to answer something like this because we were knowing when this is started in um, um, in the end of 2019 that size of this virus is around 90 to 100 nanometer as compared to SARS-CoV-1 
when SARS COVID 1 came, I was part of the pandemic team of the uh, NIH. Its size was only 30 nanometers, so its transmission was very, very limited. But 109 nanometer transmission is very, very going to be high. And once this kind of virus phylogeny is there, mutations are obvious. So we wrote to the uh, Madam Secretary, uh, Dr. Saroop, that we want to start this program and uh, submitted the proposal, well, got multi layer reviewed, but finally they agreed that we should start this program, though because no vaccine was available. Uh, only little bit things were starting in February or March related to mRNA vaccine. So I would like to say what different it comes because this is Jagrutta program. I'm talking about COVID, but also I see most of the people are the scientists. So this is very appropriate for me to talk about this platform. So there was platform one vaccine. This was it started from Professor Jenner. And a lot of vaccines came from it, vaccine generation one, whole organism either live or weakened or killed form, the polio vaccine, hepatitis C, rabies, influenza, yellow fever. So this is one of the platform and this is more than 100 year old technology. It has certain advantages, this, but certain disadvantages. So the next generation vaccine came is recombinant. Once the genetic code got uh, dissected, we can see the sequence. We can take a particular uh, uh, protein and we can make that as a vaccine. So here, hepatitis B was the first seasonal influenza, HPV, many, many vaccine came on this platform. Then the third platform which came out, this is around two decades ago, it was basically um, adenovirus or DNA platform. And for this, uh, the first vaccine which was uh, emergency approved was Ebola vaccine and another vaccine now, this is COVID. And now we can say from India, the third vaccine, DNA vaccine has come from Chidas. The last one is mRNA. So this is totally a different form. This is a synthetic in nature, totally synthetic in nature. You have a chemical structure of DNA plasmid and then everything is synthetic. And looks like this has a lot of advantage as compared to other vaccines in terms of manufacturing, in terms of making a new vaccine, but the most important in terms of this is the precise message you can give to the uh, system to make and that use that system as a basically your factory. So mRNA you have given, it will make the exact precise vaccine because in case of DNA or adenovirus, it has to come back and it has to make mRNA and it has to make the protein. Here, the precise message has been given the similar way as virus is given and you can make the protein and, and antigen can be detected by the immune system and you can move on. Now, what is the advantage and economics of manufacturing in, in generation one vaccine, which is we have already the um, uh, vaccine from our great company, Bharat Biotech, which came out. It, but it needs a huge manufacturing facility which required BSL-2, BSL-3, uh, BSL-4, and then you have to do, you have to propagate into mammalian cells and you have to harvest it and you have to do the potential assay and all those kind of things are there. This is a very effective platform. It has been used for hundreds of years, but this has some inbuilt of its uh, its questionnaire, which is like creating, making so so big uh, bioreactor, which has growing the live viruses. The second one comes out. You you have the gene sequence. You don't reach the virus, but you still you have to make the master cell bank, working cell bank, big fermenters and harvest and purification and fill and finish. The third was the same, but again, you have to run big, big bioreactors and then you have to make these big plasmids and from there you have to come back. But in case of, uh, uh, which is generation four, this is basically a prop, uh, a total synthetic. Once you have a DNA template, you can in the test tube or in a, in a, in a big vessel, you can do the in vitro transcription, do the capping and tailing, do the purification and it is available. And this process, if you see from top to bottom, this can take only a day and vaccine is ready. So this is the basically uh, advantage was thought. This is also going for a decade, a lot of trials happened, but somehow few things were missing. So now I would like to take you that why this COVID make this possible and where we were there before. So this is not a new science. The mRNA was known since 1961. And, and 
base and the most important factor is that DNA stores the information, you convert into RNA, and then RNA convert into the protein. So this is cell dogma was known. But why the information is coded into DNA? Why it coded one step forward and then the operation comes when RNA comes and then the protein comes, which is the real doer? Because it was found at that point itself also that mRNA is a transient part of the whole business. Means it has very low stability, it will degrade and go away by its own. And DNA is a very solid thing. If you throw the DNA on a, on a surface, you can come after 10 years, you can see um, that it is still stable. And now if we see there are two parts of mRNA vaccine came out. One is mRNA development, how it went to 2020 and when the first vaccine was approved and the second vaccine was approved. But also side by side, the problem was how to deliver the mRNA should not be destructed. So some lipid nanoparticle work was going on and, and this gave basically two vaccines overall, which was launched in 2020. And they are the maximum used vaccine in the world, least controversial, maximum safe and unknown of any other vaccine efficacy, which is around 94 to 96% as of today. And 94 to 96% has certain meaning why I have mentioned it important. So basically there are two components. One component is mRNA, second component is nanolipid particles. So this is makes the vaccine or other therapeutics which is going to come into it. And here I would like to give a very brief example. So you have on the five prime UTR, you have a leading frame which which of interest you want to do and then three prime UTR you can cap it but there are two type of one is non-replicating and non-replicating is upper side and which you can also bring some nuclear modified nucleosides some you can do the genetic engineering into a particular sequence and the first vaccine which was developed by uh, NIH combined with Moderna second was with Pfizer and BioNTech and third was CureVac, which somehow was not able to pass the mentor. And what Genoa is doing, it is we are using self-amplifying because in self-amplifying, we add a machinery here. So multiple copy of mRNA can be made. The only thing, the size was so big when we made it, it was around 12 kilobases. And these base vaccines are four kilobases, 12 kilobases mRNA making, keeping it stable was a big challenge for us. And because of that, most of the people have not gone through that way. So this is what we say HGCO19. This is one of the very important point when you deliver the vaccine, focus on B. This is the format where the vaccine has gone, where mRNA has been packed inside a lip in a, in a, in a, in a ball, you can say, and these are the pockets where the mRNA has been stored. And these are the components of different lipids and all that kind of things. Now, there is a problem. So problem is in these pockets, if you go further detail into these pockets, basically looks like this is degradable because of its in, uh, inherent nature. So RNA get degraded. And what is the reason for it? Looks like water is responsible for it. And this chemistry is not new, but has been published recently. And we were knowing it, so we focus on this. So basically in case of DNA, you have H group over here, but in case of RNA, you have OH group over here. And this is one particular stupid atom which creates this problem of degradation. And how does it? So you see that there is a phosphodiesterase bond and where OH group is there. And once you have the water available from here, the base is get from this OH group, the water transfer in this, and it go and hit this phosphodiesterase bond and by which these bases get degraded. So basically water is the reason for it. And to, to have this uh, degradation of mRNA, and because of that, both the vaccine has minus 70 degrees centigrade. So when you open it, you have to use in a limited time, otherwise mRNA is going to degrade it. No had said it, this is British Medical Journal published when the first lot of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine was launched, it almost missed it because that, if it, that mRNA was limited, it was degraded. And this was investigation leak came out that the vaccine has a problem. And now you can see from the data also when they did the clinical trial and today they have a little bit modified it because now they keep diluent outside, 
very concentrated mRNA they freeze at minus 70 and then add the diluent water into it and then go ahead for it. So this is, I would like to say, this is the few liner. Probably the first approved uh, vaccine for COVID-19 uh, will be mRNA. Uh, and yet uh, we can't count on them alone because uh, they're very hard to scale that manufacturing and uh, they have a logistical problem because they require an ultra cold chain. Now, scaling these for the world would mean having hundreds of millions of doses in liquid nitrogen and keeping them at that negative 80 degrees Celsius as they're carried uh, from plane out uh, to get delivered in the world. I'm hopeful that uh, as the mRNA platform matures, We'll solve both uh, the scaling uh, problems, uh, which will bring the cost down, and I will make this cold chain requirement uh, unnecessary. So this was a grand challenge program, and this year, last year, the grand challenge was India was the sponsor, so uh, Prime Minister was the key speaker, and somehow I was also on the panel. And when I had first to first face to face meeting the Prime Minister, he said. Uh, Doxing, the main problem is that we don't have infrastructure supported. And do you think that what Mr. Gates said can we solve this problem of stability? I said, sir, uh, if anybody can solve, we can also solve. So this is here the translation research come into the picture. So basically, we made a thermostable vaccine, filed a patent, and it is stable even at 25 degrees centigrade. This is minus 80 frozen. Thing. If you demonize that 5 microgram in mouse, you can see day 14, day 28, give a booster and you see the upcoming. But if you use lyophilized vaccine, this is day 14, day 28, give the booster, this is where. So there is no difference between lyophilized and uh, the vaccine which was kept at minus 70 degrees centigrade. Another thing is this is surrogate neutralization assay. It is very quick to say. So basically people who got infected, they become um, convalescent for a time being and where their neutralization title is between 60 to 40 to 60 percent. And this is what's over most of the vaccine which has been approved other than mRNA. They saw 40 to 60 percent uh, neutralization. But in our case, we go around 90 percent. So this is better than convalescent what the data we have got from the from the from our experiments. And also, we have shown the stability of the vaccine, not only 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, 25 degrees centigrade. Because what happens in transportation, we make our product and we make things forward. And we see there are some escalations. So this vaccine, we can ship even 25 degrees centigrade, but 2 to 8, we can keep it. And no exertion, uh, excursion can affect the vaccine. So this was one of the very important steps for Genova. And we have gone ahead. So we have had this vaccine. This is, has two components. If I, if I could have not able to start this program if DBD would have not given the first 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 funding for us, seed funding for 25 crores, because it was a huge, huge task for us. We were knowing on day one it is going to cost few hundred crores for us to start, and few hundred crores means close to 500 crores before we can see the vaccine get deployed. But these are the points we said: Can we use at two to eight degrees centigrade? Can we administer it into into the uh, uh, convalescent people who are uh, zero positive people can be used for other vaccines all along with that. Those are the thought process we had. And now we are in the phase two, phase three, because government has also again funded us a very generous amount, 100 crores for CT and scale up. So this is two liners I want to go. So this is the self amplifying. We give one cassette, it multiplied into many doses, then we take the nanolipid, mix it. And it is on the surface, so this is one of the more innovation we have brought. It is not packed inside the ball where, where, where water is there, and we have lifelines, so we, this we have moved on. And this is what roughly, if you want to say how it works, it moves, goes, finally it produces the antigen, and finally antibodies, B7 and T cell comes. One of the important factors I would like to say that this is the mRNA, so even the Ladder was available up to 9 kilo bases, so this was 12 kilo base, very simple science, very elegant science, but we have to develop all the tools in-house, so we have developed tools in-house, how to see the purity of mRNA. If we bound it, you can say that this is the mRNA, but if you bound with nanofit carrier, it goes and is stuck over there, and you can recover it back, it, it, 
it falls back. So it is, it is a beautiful and very simple system. When we immunized the mouse, we got the similar kind of data. Day 57, titer jump, print titers are close to 1000. Same like mRNA vaccine, it is not 160. The limit is 160 or 100. But we are having such a high titer as expected. There's a direct correlation between these two. And this is surrogate to say we, we, we have worked on this and this is looks like gives 90% thing. And here, uh, first one is myself. The second one is Ajay. We were uninfected at that time, zero. The number one was the kernel scent. You can see the three number, the, uh, the three number and it has gone up to ventilator. The fourth one is has moderate. The fifth one didn't go to hospital. And sixth one, one of our scientists, Dr. Rajesh Singh, who got infected twice. But the most important thing which we got, we got a spike specific germs and uh, B cell response with our vaccine and which is unique because it looks like it is going to give us a huge opportunity for memory cell response. So we have completed phase one. Phase one is safe, immunogenic. Everything has come out. It has been already reviewed. Phase two trial for approval has been given now. We are moving forward to phase two trials. These are, we are doing at different sites in the country. This is DBT ICMR funded sites. This point I wanted to bring to notice and I will take two minutes more before ending because I think time is finishing. So pandemic policy is also the economic policy as there is no durable end to economic crisis without end of this health crisis. When this pandemic will end? So uh, McKinsey sent a report that if you, depending upon the efficacy of vaccine and that time vaccine was not there, what population he had to humanize and considering some part of the third wave. And then that said, if your vaccine is 95% efficacious, you might have to only 40% people you have to immunize. If you are 70%, then 52%. If 50%, 75% you have to immunize. Here, if you compare with the prime boost, the kind of population we have, if our vaccine, even 75%, we have to give 208 dose, 208 crores. We are doing a great, fabulous job, but it's still a long way to come till Another part came out, which is the part I think we have not talked today and I wanted to bring a notice. So this is in July came out that titers are waning. Once you give it, if you see within 70 days, the titers for, for mRNA vaccine, which is Pfizer BioNTech, it has gone around 2.5 fold, while AstraZeneca vaccine has already having much lower titer, has gone five fold down. And if it is happening, then the chances of reinfection is there. Again, the another publication has came out in July, where if you give two doses, the titer goes up, but titer wanes out, and this is totally independent study. And it, it the conversant person, if you give titer goes out, but it, it is start waning within 70 to 90 days. If you can say in the representation form, this is the AstraZeneca vaccine and this is Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, but in both the cases, titer wanes out. If the titer wanes out, then we have a worry point. This is one of the examples had been published in July that if you give a single dose to the conversion people, it titers goes to the top mRNA vaccine because there is a memory has left into that. So this is another problem is happening. So today, why I wanted to show this slide, most of the 70 to 80 percent population is already having pre-existing some sort of zero positivity. Single dose of mRNA takes it to peak. Second dose doesn't make a big difference. And in other case, if you have to give a the patient, it has to give. So hopefully, when the mutation is coming, how the part is going to play. So this is one of the slides have been, have been published by Nature Medicine. I don't want to go into data, but consent is here. So mRNA vaccine has gone. Novavax has also seen some signs, though it has not been approved yet. But mRNA vaccines are showing very good advantage, other than Sputnik, which has come, which is giving two different kind of things. So I'm saying the titers are very important. If waning is out, there is an issue with it. And if the new 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 kind of variants are coming, there is also a huge problem for us. So at present, for the clinical correlates of protection, people are looking, we are also looking into it. But what mRNA gives the advantage? So these are the part. This is nanoparticle, enzymes, cofactor. You can stockpile. Any new variant comes, you can take it, take the plasmid, mix it. Mix it and finally the vaccine is ready and this time is around 50 days. Only 50 days you can have this new version of the vaccine. We have made the Delta version and all of that. 
So basically what this technology offers, this is scalable, synthetic, inexpensive, efficacious, and safe. And hopefully not only it will go, give us COVID, but it is going to give us other part also. So this is, we consider the national pride. We are competing globally and let's see, if we can create a disease agnostic platform. So yes, mutants are the worry. This is the team which we started with. Now the number has gone big. So I just want to take in some more time than what is given. So I will close from here. If some questions, I'm ready to answer it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing this useful information and also the efforts made by the Genova Pharmaceuticals, sorry, Genova uh, Biopharmaceuticals Limited towards the research and development of COVID-19 vaccine. Thanks for sparing your precious time. We are still in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. Government is trying its best to get everybody vaccinated and so that nobody should left behind and according to official data about half of the uh, population indian population has taken uh, their first jab we are moving towards next lecture to be delivered by dr sanjeev sinha sir he will be speaking on management of covid and vaccination in the adult population dr sanjeev sinha sir is a professor of medicine at all india institute of medical sciences delhi and an eminent physician an excellent researcher in the area of pulmonary medicine and infectious diseases. He has been a member of the National Academy of Sciences India and also a member of American Thoracic Society for the past 10 years. He has worked hard to promote the use of technology and also looked forward to bring new low-cost drugs to India to care, treat poor patients suffering with tuberculosis. Over to you, sir. Dr. Sanjeev Sinha, sir. Sir, we are going to share your slides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sir, should uh, we share? Can you, uh, can you see okay, my sir. slides? I have, yeah, yes, Can sir, you yes. see my slides? Okay, yes, thank sir. you very much. You can see. Okay, uh, good, good afternoon. And I would, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Nasi, uh, Professor Manju Sama, and Professor Mishra for giving this opportunity. And uh, I'm going to speak today on management of uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, as we know that uh, still we have about uh, 25 to 30,000 patients per day from Keral and about 5,000 uh, COVID positive patient per day from Maharashtra and some uh, states from South India are still having around uh, uh, 1,000 to 1,500 patients suffering with the COVID every day. So still, we can see that uh, phase two is not over in some part of South, some part of uh, country. And uh, so we have to be very careful. Now, still we uh, are predicting there could be third wave. And uh, we are hoping with the help of vaccine, there'll be less number of patients or less severe number of patients if uh, there is a third wave. So I just want to give brief idea uh, about uh, uh, how to treat a patient because being a clinician, I've been involved in the treatment of uh, COVID patient and uh, we have made the guidelines, AIMS have made the guidelines with the help of ICMR and uh, we are following those guidelines and we have distributed to other part of country also. So as we know that COVID-19 is a viral infection caused by sars coronavirus 2 it is spread through droplets and incubation period is between 2 to 14 days. And uh, what we have seen that, that uh, most of the patient, about 80% patients are asymptomatic and about uh, uh, asymptomatic or having mild infection. And then we have around uh, uh, 10 to 15% with moderate to severe disease. And generally, a presentation of uh, COVID infection, patient complained of high-grade fever, moderate to high-grade fever, and then they have a kind of uh, uh, nose discharge, sore throat, and uh, cough. And then they have uh, some in the moderate to severe disease, they complained of 
uh, so shortness of breath and desaturation, they, they have low oxygen level. So that I'm going to discuss in the next few slides. So what is appropriate COVID behavior? This is very important to understand about, uh, about the appropriate COVID behavior. So there are three components which are uh, we, we insisting to follow. One is social distancing, another is face mask, and, and, and number three is hand hygiene. So what is social distancing? We have to maintain a distance between the two person, two meter, uh, uh, two meter or three feet distance between the two person. So there could not be transfer infection from one person to another person. And then there have to be proper use of face masks. As previous uh, uh, speaker have shown very well that how we have to use the mask. This is very important. So there have to be proper use of the face mask. Nose have to be covered. I uh, then mouth have to be covered properly. So you cannot spread infection to other, or you cannot receive the infection from the infected person. And then another important thing: hand hygiene. So we have to we take care about hand hygiene. We can use the uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. We can use we can wash our hand by soap. And uh, it is very important to understand that we have to not touch the uh, our eyes, nose, or mouth uh, 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 repeatedly because uh, we uh, receive the infection through nose, mouth, or eyes. And then another important thing, we have to avoid the uh, gathering, like there is a lot of social gathering, or if you're going to, uh, to the market, then we have to avoid the overcrowding. If we have to do our work as soon as possible, then we have to come back. So this is also very important. We have to avoid more gathering or crowding. And then there is a respiratory hygiene. If you are having cough and you are in the office or in the social gathering then you have to be careful and if you are coughing then either you have to use your hanky or you have to use a elbow just hold the elbow and then you can do coughing if you're not wearing the mask so this is the concept of social distancing you can see there is a six feet distance or two meters distance between two persons and the basis of six me. feet Excuse yeah. me, Tata, your slides are not visible, sir. Okay. Just one second. Please make it on the full screen, sir. Can you see it now? No, sir, not yet. Okay. I think it's uh, working from my side. I don't know. Is there any technical problem? Archana ji, you, you can, you can uh, uh, sh uh, present Allowed the slide share from me. your end. Should we share it from our end? If yes, you allow sure. It? I have emailed to you. Yeah, please. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. So, oh, uh, by the time I'll just, uh, can I continue? I'll. So, please, oh, okay. come on the diagnosis slide. This is, I think, slide number four, fifth. Next, please. Next. 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 So coming to the uh, diagnosis of COVID-19 infection. So any patient who is having, can you hear me? Can you see the slides, Arjuna ji? Yeah, yeah, we can see the slides now and hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So. So previous slide, please, Arjunaji, previous slide. So we have uh, kind of, what 
diagnostic tool we use for the diagnosis of COVID-19. So we have uh, some uh, investigation which are very important, like if some patient is having complaint of uh, uh, sore throat, fever, uh, nasal discharge, then we ask them to do RT-PCR test. Uh, we use throat and nasopharyngeal swab, and then we, we uh, put in the viral transport media or submit to the uh, laboratory. And we have some more uh, tests like CBNET or TrueNET, uh, where also we do throat and nasopharyngeal swab, and uh, we have rat or uh, rapid antigen test uh, by uh, where we also take the throat and pharyngeal uh, swab and uh, this is kind of rapid test we can get the result within uh, uh, five to ten minutes on the spot and uh, mostly positive if result is positive then uh, positive rate and sensitivity is high and we use this uh, kind of rat test in the uh, in the hospital before doing any procedure like uh, bronchoscopy or uh, any other test, any minor surgical test. So uh, positive test is very, sensitivity is very high. Then uh, we have serological tests like uh, antibody tests. Uh, we are doing IgG and IgM in the blood, and this is mostly used for the seroservalence. Next, please. Yeah. So uh, briefly, I'll tell about the drugs which we use for the treatment of uh, 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 COVID-19. And uh, you can see here we have uh, some investigational drugs which played major role in first wave and second wave uh, for mild to moderate and severe infection of uh, COVID-19. And you can see ivermectin. Uh, this is very important drug we give in patient. This is actually antiparasitic drug, but we have some uh, antiviral activity also. Then hydrochloroquine, and uh, we have injection remdesivir, and uh, then we have tablet favipiravir. This is also antiviral drugs and have been shown uh, good activity for the treatment of uh, uh, COVID-19 infection. Next, please. Then we have certain more uh, drugs like immunomodulator. Uh, we have, uh, there is a very important role of corticosteroid and uh, it has been seen that uh, uh, corticosteroid is kind of life-saving drug in moderate to severe infection. We generally avoid giving this in the mild stage because uh, if patient is having mild infection, then there could be uh, viral replication if you give steroid in the early stage. So mostly we use in the moderate to severe stage of the infection. Then we have other drugs like vitamin C, zinc, and tocilizumab is also one of the important drugs and we, it has been found important when uh, there is a raised IL-6 um, and uh, there is a severe infection in uh, that time we use uh, tocilizumab. Next please. Then we have some more drugs as some antibiotics like uh, uh, that we also give to prevent the secondary bacterial infection like doxycycline, uh, azithromycin, and we also have drugs like no molecular weight heparin. Uh, that is also we give to prevent any thrombosis uh, in these patients. And uh, another important, uh, very important tool is oxygen delivery. Oxygen is a kind of life-saving in the patient who are suffering with uh, COVID-19. And in the second wave, there is a lot of requirement of oxygen and these patients due to severity of the infection. Next, please. So coming to the uh, coming to the interim guidelines from AIMS and uh, ICMR. So as per guideline, we divide uh, COVID management in three uh, types, mild, COVID-19, moderate COVID-19, and severe COVID-19. So first I'll tell about the mild COVID-19 infection. Next, please. So if somebody is tested positive, like if somebody is having uh, symptoms of uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, like uh, nasal discharge, fever, sore throat, coughing, and uh, then we do the COVID, uh, RT-PCR test and we see if it is positive, then uh, as per severity, we divide mild, mild, moderate, and severe. 
so in patient when we say patient is having mild disease mild disease means when patient is having mild symptoms they are not having shortness of breath when they measure oxygen saturation their saturation will be more than 95% at the room air and they will their blood pressure will be normal they they will not having any severe symptoms like confusion or disorientation or uh, hypotension or any other organ involvement so in that case we ask the patient to just to discuss with the nearby physician or covid facility and stay at home do home quarantine use face mask uh, uh, to avoid any uh, avoid contact and uh, droplet precaution uh, do uh, take droplet precaution and do strict hand hygiene and stay at home if you have anything like if you are having oxygen saturation uh, less than 92% or having difficulty in breathing having any chest pain mental confusion or inability to arouse or developing bluish discoloration of lips or face due to cyanosis or hypoxia or there is a decrease urine output then you have to immediately inform your uh, nearby doctor or covid facility and if you require oxygen like if you are having oxygen saturation less than 92% then we need to admit you immediately and we also advise to the patient to take a uh, tablet paracetamol and uh, 500 mg sos and to take plenty of oral fluid hydrate yourself and uh, do take some drugs like sq or uh, ivermectin uh, uh, to for the treatment of covid-19 the next please so another thing we find out from the patient if they are having high risk group like if they are more than 60 years of age they are having underlying cardiovascular disease including hypertension if they are having diabetes or receiving immuno compromised drugs or having immuno compromised state like hiv or chronic infection if they are having chronic lung disease chronic liver disease or chronic kidney disease if they are having cerebrovascular disease obesity respiratory distress then we have to admit them immediately to the hospital uh, in, in nearby covid facility and uh, we have to treat them as per guideline so coming to the moderate uh, covid illness next please arjuna ji next please so coming to the moderate covid 19 illness so in moderate case when the respiratory rate when patient is dyspneic he is having shortness of breath and if you measure their respiratory rate it should be more than 24 per minute if oxygen level at the room air is less than 92% if you measure uh, your oxygen level by using finger probe or pulse oximeter then it should be less than 92% and uh, at that stage patient required oxygen support so if patient is having normal blood pressure he is conscious he can manage at home then what we do we advise them if they have home oxygen then we can advise them to take the home oxygen at home and if you are not feeling comfortable if you are having hypertension or if you are having comorbid morbid state as i discussed in the previous slide then we have to admit patient immediately to the hospital so what we do we shift to the patient to the hospital and we start oxygen support and we try to maintain oxygen level between 92% to 96% and then we give them preferably non rebreathing face mask we give us oxygen through face mask on nasal cannula and if there is a more a high requirement of the oxygen then we use high flow nasal cannula and we generally if patient is not responding to oxygen then we ask them to the prone uh, we ask them to lie down through your abdomen and that is called prone position that is also help to increase the uh, uh, oxygen saturation next please then we do certain uh, we do certain baseline tests like we do uh, hemoglobin tlc dlc we do kidney function test we do liver function test in the blood and then we do other blood tests like crp d dimer uh, tropi il6 
and we do coagulation profile and uh, ferritin level also. So these are some tests which give idea how much inflammation in the body or how much severity of disease patient is having. And then we give, uh, in uh, some cases required, we give remdesivir 200 milligram IV and day one, and then we give 100 milligram IV for four more days. And then we give methylprednisolone estriad. I, I, as I said in the beginning, that estriad are life-saving in moderate to severe illness of COVID-19 infection. So it is very important to take appropriate uh, dosing of the methyl uh, of the estriad. And we have to be very sure if patient is having diabetes, then we have to be very sure about the treatment of diabetes. Because in the second wave, we have seen there was a irrational use of steroid. And due to that, many patients develop uh, uh, diabetes and patients who had diabetes, they, ha they were not given proper treatment due to some reason, uh, due to severity of disease or other causes. And because of that, patient later on received several opportunistic infection, including mucormycosis. So this is very important to understand that use of appropriate use of steroid is very important. And if patient is having diabetes, then we have to treat diabetes also. And we give patient anticoagulation therapy in form of low molecular weight heparin to avoid any coagulation, any thrombosis uh, in these patients. Next, please. So coming to the uh, coming to the severe disease. So what is severe disease? When patient is not responding to uh, oxygen therapy with a uh, mask or they are having hypotension, they develop severe infection, they develop super infection, including sepsis or bacterial or fungal infection, then they need to be admitted in the ICU and this is called severe disease, and they have to be given uh, oxygen through uh, high flow nasal cannula, or if required, we use helmet uh, interface, or we use non-invasive ventilation therapy. And we try to maintain oxygen level more than uh, 95%. So if even patient is not responding to uh, these uh, techniques, then these instruments, then we give patient uh, ventilated support. We give mechanical, mechanical ventilation and put them on ventilated support. So this is very important to give ventilated support patient on time because we have seen in second wave that many patients who received a ventilated support in the time they came out from the illness and they went back home uh, in the healthy stage. So another drugs, like uh, we have already discussed that um, uh, steroids are very important and they have kind of life-saving in the severe disease. And we give low molecular weight heparin and uh, we give ventilatory support if required. And we treat secondary infection like sepsis or bacterial infection uh, as per local antibiogram. And uh, we give proper nutrition to rise tube to these patients and use sedation if required. Next, please. So, uh, so that, uh, and also there's a role of tocilizumab. When uh, 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 we have seen if patient is having IL-6 10 times more than normal, or there is an advanced stage of the disease, then we give tocilizumab, and we, we have seen there is, uh, patient are responding to this drug also. Next, please. Yeah. So, and uh, this was in brief about the treatment of COVID-19 infection in the mild, moderate, and severe disease. Now I'll just tell briefly about the different kind of vaccine which are available in our country. So uh, 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 we uh, there is also a big uh, trial is going for the BCG vaccine in COVID-19. And this trial is funded by uh, ICMR. And this is going on the 14 centers in India, including Ames, New Delhi. So uh, we have seen that countries without universal policies of BCG vaccine 
uh, affected, uh, more severely affected as compared to countries which have uh, universal policy for BCG. And we have also seen that BCG protects the vaccinated elderly population. And there is some liter literature we say that uh, BCG vaccine also reduced the number of reported COVID-19 cases in a country where it has been used, already used. The combination of reduced morbidity and mortality makes BCG vaccine a potential new tool in the fight against COVID-19. And uh, revaccination of BCG of high risk population would offer protection against COVID-19. So this is, uh, we are doing one trial and we have done the interim analysis and it is showing that uh, patient who received the BCG having better uh, response, I mean, they're having less number of patients have been affected with COVID-19 as compared to PLASPO. And uh, uh, the uh, if patient in someone had uh, infection, then severity of infection was less and there was less requirement of admission in the, uh, in the hospital. Next, please. Then uh, we have, uh, uh, next, please. Uh, yeah. So we have another important, uh, very important, uh, vaccine that is co vaccine. It is made in India. It is uh, made by Bharat uh, Biotech International Limited in collaboration with ICMR and uh, uh, NIV Pune. And uh, the vaccine is delivered from strain of SARS coronavirus to isolation. And uh, uh, composition of vaccine includes inactivated coronavirus. And uh, ICMR and Bharat Biotech. In International Limited jointly work for development of this vaccine. And the uh, 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 government of India, the CGI grant the permission in the first, in the second week of January 2021 uh, for the MNC use of this uh, uh, this vaccine. Next, please. Then we have another Phoenix, important Phoenix. vaccine. Yeah. Phoenix, P-H-O-E-N-I-X. Yeah. But then we have another very important vaccine that is COVID shield. And uh, this, uh, uh, this is adenovirus vaccine. And uh, uh, this is made by AstraZeneca, joins with the Pune based Serum Institute of India for making COVID shield. Uh, in the first week of January 2021, the DCGI grant the permission for the restricted MNC for the uh, MNC use of this vaccine in India. Next, please. Then we have uh, a, a, a Moderna vaccine that is also uh, approved by TCGI for MNC use in India. And uh, this is a RNA based vaccine. And we have, next please. We have another vaccine that is uh, a Pfizer vaccine. Uh, it is not yet approved in India for emergency use, but uh, it has been approved in uh, USA and uh, European countries and some other countries. And uh, this is also a mRNA based vaccine. Next, please. Next, please. So then we have very important, uh, another important vaccine that is Sputnik V vaccine. This is uh, uh, approved by, this is also approved by DCGI for uh, use in India. And this, uh, uh, this vaccine uh, we give in uh, two doses, three weeks apart and efficacy is around 90%. And then recently we have, very, next please. Recently we have, Approval of Jaco VD COVID-19 vaccine. This is DNA-based vaccine, and this is made by Jadas, uh, and this is also totally made in India vaccine. And uh, DCJ have given uh, given approval of this vaccine uh, for the emergency emergency use in the August uh, uh, 2021. So, very important thing is here that. This vaccine can also be used in the children above the 12 years of age. This is the first vaccine in India which we can use uh, in the children who have 
uh, is more than 12 years and i think very soon in a uh, few weeks or next month will this uh, vaccine will be available in the market and uh, this is kind of needleless vaccine and uh, uh, we use this by jet technique and we uh, in the skin and uh, we give 50% uh, of uh, dose in each arm and we give three doses four weeks apart for this vaccine next please So another uh, very important vaccine that is also approved by DCJ in India for emergency use this is Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. And this vaccine is having single dose and it is a viral vector-based vaccine and approved by DCJ in the August uh, 2021. So now uh, I would like to stop my talk here. And uh, uh, if any question is there, then I'm, I'll be happy to take that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, valuable insights on this very important topic that is COVID management and vaccination. Thank it's you. Sunday, sir. Bye -bye. Yes. Yes. So we just heard about the vaccination and how it can, the disease can be managed by the vaccination process. And vaccines seem to be the most uh, reliable and cost-effective public health interventions and the most potential tool in the fight against the virus. But the vaccine hesitancy still remains the most pressing problems, one of the most pressing problems before the public health authorities. We are very much honored to have Honorable Professor V.P. Kambo, sir, the past president of NASI, a very eminent scientist in the area of endocrinology and drug development, the uh, former director of PDRI Lucknow and the chairman of board of directors, VCIL. Sir is going to share with us his expertise on very important topic, vaccine hesitancy, a key hindrance to achieving herd immunity. Request you, sir, to please enlighten us and share your views. Over to you, sir. Sir, you are not audible, please. Please unmute, sir. Am I visible now? Slides yes, are visible and I am audible. Yes. yes, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Mishra for inviting me to join you on this Jagrukta Abhiyan. Manjuji, I see Dr. Chandriman Shaha. So I am taking another aspect where vaccines are available and vaccine hesitancy is there. And this is the now becoming a block in achieving herd immunity. What is vaccine hesitancy? That's reluctance or refusal to be vaccinated or to have some dependent vaccinated because of safety of the vaccine. Hesitancy is an unexpected problem, especially in the middle of the epidemic. Hesitancy has led to decline in vaccine uptake globally, where vaccines are available in plenty, people are not taking it. This can delay our flight against, fight against the pandemic. We in India are used to taking vaccines from pregnancy and childbirth. Three vaccines are given within 12 hours of birth. 
they are tb polio and hepatitis b and then 11 vaccines are taken within two years and then continued gradually till 12 years of age why vaccine hesitancy knowing that only vaccines can eliminate disease we have taken vaccines since childhood three vaccines within 12 hours of birth and 11 till 12 years of age we know that vaccines are the only therapy which can eliminate disease globally as in smallpox and polio we know that some vaccines provide lifelong immunity or freedom from disease diphtheria mumps rubella we also know that vaccinating about 90% population will eliminate COVID-19 pandemic. Why then hesitate to take COVID-19 vaccine to end the corona pandemic? Why hesitation to COVID-19, which can end the pandemic? COVID-19 vaccine injection primes your immune system to develop immunity against the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus for future infections. On vaccinating about 90% people with COVID-19 vaccine, herd immunity is achieved. This 90% has been taken, although suggests that 70% to 50%, but 90% is the present experience and taking from polio vaccine. Previously, it was thought 80%. Now, from polio vaccine, they say 90%. Or when most of the people, population say 90%, get exposed to coronavirus and see 10% mortality, herd immunity will be achieved. Herd immunity will provide protection to those who are not exposed to virus or vaccinated. Vaccine is the best, safe, and effective way to protect you against future COVID-19 infection and build herd immunity and end COVID-19 pandemic. Thus, vaccines will not only protect you, your relations, and friends, but countrymen and immunity globally. Herd immunity is critical to end COVID-19 pandemic, and this can be generated either by infecting 90% of people and then seeing a mortality of 10%, or by vaccinating about 90% people, and that provides you security from that disease. Thus, remaining 10% are coming in contact with sick person won't get sick and spread the disease. If exposed to infection after vaccination, only a few hospitalized, uh, only a few people are hospitalized. You have seen now in US, roughly 1 lakh cases are seen daily, but those who are hospitalized are primarily who have not taken the vaccination previously. Thus, vaccine will provide herd immunity and ensure safe and secure society. Why vaccine hesitancy? Knowing COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. COVID-19 vaccines have been used now for nearly 18 months globally and over seven months in India. Covaxin is 77.8% protective and 93% against severe disease. Covishield, the second vaccine used in this country, is 70% protective and 81% against severe disease. And the third vaccine, Sputnik V, 92% protective and 100% against severe disease. Both Covaxin and Covishield are effective 60 to 90% against all known variants of SARS CoV 2, CoV 2 known till date. Full immunization offers about 96% protection from hospitalization and about 76% from infection. Speedy development led to vaccine hesitancy, no rules evaded and compromised. This is how the people how the vaccines have been developed in 9 to 12 months instead of 9 to 12 years, which is the common time. This happened because of a close cooperation amongst academia, industry, government, and rolling review by regulator. Leads from previous coronaviruses, MERS, and Ebola virus infections 
and advancement of technology led to development of vaccine in two to three months. One or two doses of vaccine needed for effectivity. Thus, safety in animals is needed for seven days or maximum 50 days and antibody monitoring for 30 days. So the total time taken here is one to two months, two to three months for development, one to two months for the safety in animals. Then the phase one and two clinical trial, that is safety and efficacy in 100 to 200 volunteers, antibody title monitoring against two to three months. Phase three placebo controlled double blind clinical trial in more than 20,000 human subjects with high dose incidence completed in three months. Thus, you, if, if you calculate the minimum time taken is nine months and the maximum is 12 months in this type of situation, when there is a COVID-19 pandemic, normally the phase three clinical trial would take five to six years, but here the trials have been completed in three months time. Thus, vaccines are safe and effective to prevent COVID-19 disease and no rules have been evaded or compromised, so safety is ensured. How hesitancy developed in our country? Some people will always be hesitant, reluctant, and uncertainty with vaccines. Some have been misguided to become hesitant to vaccines due to a lot of misinformation on social media. Uncalled for statements by some scientists and politicians created controversy on licensing of indigenously developed vaccine, that is co-vaccine, thereby challenging integrity of Indian science and regulations. They felt it was imperfect vaccine being hastened in licensing because it was made in India issue. Politicians lost no time in confusing people on this issue. How can India develop vaccine in nine to 10 months was the major question. Some senior virologists doubted integrity of Indian science, scientists, experts, and regulators by media statements saying won't take COVID Co-vaccine till phase three study data released, creating doubts amongst corona variants, that's healthcare workers and public. They were not concerned about the mortality seen with the COVID-19 disease. Some politicians said won't take vaccines till developed by their government after coming to power. Some religious leaders advocated vaccines induced infertility, which was also seen in 80s when vitamin A for blindness was given. Some religious leaders advocated that their scriptures say, don't interfere with the will of God, who is the savior and will cure COVID-19. What are the consequences of hesitation? Doctors and frontline workers became hesitant to use it. Public also hesitant to use. COVID shield controversies in Europe and demand from abroad increased acceptability of co-vaccine abroad. So thus, people stopped talking about the co-vaccine uh, uh, approval in a hurry. Certain political parties, NGOs, are still questioning use of vaccines and not supporting programs. In this country, in the last fortnight, a NGO has gone to court stopping mandatory vaccines uh, uh, with COVID-19. Vaccine politics has played a significant role in the vaccine hesitancy. Be it discrediting vaccines, spreading rumors to fuel vaccine hesitancy, frequently changing position on the vaccine distribution process, deliberately asking for the vaccine to be open for all, despite knowing that the government was following the scientific order of priority and there was a limited production of the vaccine. It cannot be produced to as many doses as you desire. Vaccine production takes time, but they were very, say that it should be given to all immediately. It cannot be given. So thus government followed the population of the states and then gave them the vaccine as required. Critical analysis since vaccination reduction shows that everything possible has been done to harm India's vaccination drive. Leaders and scientists varied stands for vaccines. Leaders encouraged vaccinated people to stop following COVID appropriate behavior. This is globally. Unvaccinated people also stopped 
these buyers. USA, Germany, France, and UK, UK scientists now attributing increases in corona cases to unvaccinated citizens or anti vaccinators. Our hesitancy to use vaccines will aid second corona wave to continue and invite third wave soon. Show the path to dwell world by getting vaccinated soon. Prime Minister of India led from front to advocate use of vaccines. Chief Ministers also promoting use in their states. Health Minister, Chairman Vaccine Committee, Health Secretary, Director General ICMA, and Director All India Institute of Medical, Medical Sciences advocated use of vaccines. Political parties didn't laud Indian scientists and industry. Most political parties didn't suggest positive measures to promote vaccines except to Twitter suggestions. Hardly any public or religious leader advocated vaccine use in their influential area. Blame games on TV media by parties rather than dispelling hesitance. Indian Prime Minister launched the world's largest vaccine drive on 16th January 2021. But even before the rollout could take place, the country witnessed many efforts that began to spread vaccine hesitancy and confuse and mislead the public on the vaccination process. Fourth zero survey that is 60, more than 67% population have antibodies against coronavirus. Rural is 67.7% urban. So hardly any difference between the rural and urban. Females and males hardly any difference. And even it has found that children too have been uh, have uh, around about 70% antibodies that they too have been exposed. Till 6 September, 528.5 million persons vaccinated with one dose. That is almost double the US population and 159 million persons with both doses. That is 687.5 million and 159 million is the population of UK and Germany combined together and almost 50% of the US population. Vaccine hesitancy is not confined to India, it is global. A common phenomenon determined because it is because of the determination of vaccine safety and efficacy, guiding factors are public health policies, social factors, and messages supplied by media. Vaccine hesitancy reason, perceived risks versus benefits, certain religion beliefs, lack of knowledge and awareness, less acceptance, by healthcare workers because of the hesitancy. See, overall vaccine hesitancy globally is 30%. Vaccine highest hesitancy, highest in the Middle East, about 75%. Hesitancy in high income countries, USA and Northern Europe, that means almost 50% people don't want to get vaccinated. Vaccine hesitancy low in poor income countries, South Asia and East Africa, where surveys have been done, less than 10%. High income groups, least certain about their safety. That is, surveys in USA and Northern Europe have shown. Low income groups, particularly South Asia and East Africa, believe that vaccines are safe. That means poor people are uh, believing that they are safe. And where is given in plenty, that's the high income people, they say that they are hesitant about safety. USA 22% won't take and 27% hesitant, but may take it. That means almost 50% are hesitant. New York 66, 3.6% hesitant. We as compared, Mumbai is 23.2%. London hesitancy is 32.7%. Vaccine hesitancy more in developed world. And if we look into a recent survey in uh, United States about the vaccine hesitancy, which was concluded on 30th August, 50% people are hesitant to take it. But all of them say that 57% support vaccination for those who are air travelers. So more than 50% again for those who visit in crowded places, bars or restaurants. 62% believe Vaccination mandatory for healthcare workers, 
where if you look as the healthcare workers hesitancy is more than Professor Kambo sir is not audible. Perhaps he has lost connection, so there is some connectivity problem with at his end only.
have to share the slides again. You know, the slides are not visible. Sir, your slides are not visible. Dr. Thamboj is muted. Sir, slides are not visible. Hello? Yes, sir. My slides are... Uh... हेलो यस अर्चना किसकी स्लाइड विजिबल नहीं है बेटा सर आपकी सर कुछ चल रहा था फिर वो लग रहा है कि कुछ कनेक्टिविटी वो कुछ कनेक्शन का कुछ प्रॉब्लम आ गया वो वो हमारी स्लाइड्स में जी सर कहां से आई अब ये अभी दिख नहीं रहा है सर अभी दिख नहीं रहा है आपको स्लाइड्स नहीं दिख रही हैं अर्जुन आई थिंक ही हैज टू शेयर अगेन अर्चना ही हैज टू शेयर अगेन आई थिंक यस सर यस सर अभी अभी जाने तो सब पहले खुले तो सही टाइम लगता है तो करे आ गया ना यस सर इट्स विजिबल नाउ कहां तक कर्चना पहले हुआ था हेलो जी सर सर आगे सॉल्व करवाइए इसको सर स्लाइड ट्वेंटी वन यस सर ओके हाँ सर यहाँ पर ये चल रहा है यहाँ से यस सर हर इम्यूनिटी कैन बी जनरेटेड आइडर नाइंटी परसेंट ऑफ पॉपुलेशन गेट एक्सपोज्ड टू वायरस और द इन्फेक्शन एंड ह Slide twenty one. Okay. You are towards the end of your uh, slides, actually. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yes, sir. Yes. India's vaccine drive, despite hesitancy. 
Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, let me share my slides and please tell me if you can see the slides. Yes, sir. Please make it on the full screen. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Thank okay. You, okay. So, uh, thank you very much uh, to Nasi and particularly uh, Dr. Mishra for inviting me to give uh, a talk on COVID-19. Uh, most of the topics have been covered. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, today is, you know, talk, uh, take you through uh, what we have learned uh, over uh, one year and eight months. Uh, what are the gaps uh, which are there and uh, possible uh, way ahead? And uh, that's strictly my opinion, uh, but we can discuss if there are questions. Okay. So uh, here's a timeline. Uh, the first case uh, was identified in December 8 in China and uh, China alerted uh, WHO on December 31st. Uh, and afterwards WHO declared uh, it has a pandemic in March uh, 11. And uh, we know all this, I'll not uh, take you through the entire thing, but what we know today is we have over 221 million cases in 221 countries and over 4.5 million deaths. If we compare this number to the last pandemic we had, which was H1N1 in 2009, the estimates were somewhere around 0.2 to 0.5 million, according to CDC. So these numbers are clearly 10 times more and people don't believe these numbers and they think uh, that these numbers are much higher. So we will have to wait uh, until the end of this pandemic and until uh, we do the entire analysis. Now in terms of India, uh, we got the first case in Kerala in January 30th. And then we had a 21 day uh, lockdown, we opened up uh, and uh, the cases started increasing. Uh, we took pretty much everyone else and we became major, but then, you know, uh, we had a vaccination program and we thought that after this vaccination, everything will be over. Uh, but we know that after we started this, it was slow and we had a massive second peak. Uh, and then uh, as of now, we have, you know, seen over 33 million cases in 0.4 million deaths. These are the reported numbers uh, which are there on the WHO and we know that the numbers are much higher. So what we have learned over the period of time from this is that uh, we need to work together and no one institution or no one agency or no one ministry uh, is capable of handling all this together. We need to work together if we have to contain this uh, pandemic. Uh, I don't know why my slides are not moving now. Yes. Did it change? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, testing is something where India did very well and, uh, uh, this this in this pandemic uh, we learned that private uh, you know participation is very very important uh, no few institutions you know can really do this and after we had private participations it became wonderful and i can tell you the from the pune experience what we have is that uh, earlier when it started only niv was testing and then nccs got involved in doing rt pcr testing we were testing uh, samples from Satara, Kolhapur, uh, and Nasik. And then what we learned over a period of time that the, all these places learn how to do RT-PCR. They started their own testing, so we stopped. And then private players came, and now the situation in, in Pune is such that you can call the private players. They come at your home. 
they pick up the samples and they give you a report by the end of the day. Uh, and therefore, such things would have never been, never happened. And we have never seen this in earlier pandemics because private players were not involved. We also have a self uh, testing kit now uh, by multiple companies. Uh, I'm just showing here my lab. Uh, although these uh, antigen tests are not as sensitive as what we would like to do and as the RT-PCR. Uh, the problem what we have is that, you know, if we think about the testing uh, screening, particularly at the airports, we still rely on thermal scanning, which is obviously not going to work. And we have learned that over a period of time that this is not working because 80% of the population, what we have infected people are asymptomatic and you're not going to detect them simply by doing thermal scanning. And therefore, what we really need is something better than that for screening at the airports or wherever people are entering. Something like, you know, a rapid test, which is maybe a breath test. And uh, if you see that who has developed, uh, I was looking at the data and what I saw that the, the University of uh, Singapore has developed a rapid breath test, which can be employed, uh, you know, at the airports or other places. And this would help. So India needs to uh, develop a technology which can be kept instead of thermal uh, scanning. Or if we are unable to do so quickly, then maybe you know collaborate with the University of Singapore and get the know-how. If we look at the current situation, you know we have already seen uh, two uh, peaks: the Pacific or smaller, the second huge. Uh, if you compare this with the US or the European countries, we see that they have seen many more peaks because it started earlier there. And uh, these next, if you see uh, the number of positive, these are strictly based on the number of positive what have been reported, uh, only 2.4% uh, uh, positivity is what uh, has been reported on the, you know, based on the data. Again, this is a WHO data uh, provided uh, by the ICMR, which is there on the portal. If you see other uh, countries, their uh, positivity is somewhere around 10 to 11% uh, globally. What it means is that we tested many, many uh, less number of cases than what we should have. If we look at the percent positivity, uh, the percent uh, positivity based on the last ICMR survey is 67%, so compared 2.4% to 67%, so we are lagging this, and this is something to think about it, and we need to improve. Uh, in terms of vaccination, uh, if you see, we have 14.5% vaccination. I'm talking about uh, both the doses. If you look at single dose, then uh, we have uh, vaccinated almost 50%. If you look at the other countries, uh, USA has only 50% to 51% uh, vaccination more due to uh, the hesitancy, which has been talked about. Uh, UK and Spain have much more, 62 and 68%. Uh, now, uh, if you see uh, what is the result of this, and let's look at the data. Uh, you see that although they have a wave going on right now, uh, look at the US, the fourth wave is going on here. Also in the UK, there is currently they, are, they have a wave as, as well as the Spain and other European countries. We see that the number of deaths are much, much less. So wherever the vaccination is more, the number of deaths have decreased. Look, look at the bottom uh, panel. So upper one is cases and below is the death. If you see the number of deaths are uh, much less now. What this means, uh, uh, one can translate this into is that uh, if we have to reduce the number of deaths, we must vaccinate all our people as fast as possible. Yes, uh, the current situation in India uh, is that uh, Kerala is still battling with a fresh wave, which we see now the question is, uh, should we be worried about this? The answer is both Yes and no. Uh, no, because uh, Kerala is managing their cases uh, very well, and the number of deaths they have kept very low, uh, and they, that's the good part. 
the answer, uh, yes, we should be worried because uh, more the infection, more is the mutation, and more is the chances of generating variants and particularly variants of concerns. And therefore, uh, we will have to keep our infection uh, rate low uh, throughout India if we have to, uh, if we, you know, have to get it up all these uh, variants uh, which are of concerns and we uh, have to contain the infection. That's the only way. I have trouble changing the slides. Yeah. Now, one another thing uh, that happened, uh, you know, globally uh, after, uh, you know, the avian influenza, people thought that this is going to be a problem. There was a global initiative on sharing avian influenza data or GSAID, and all the COVID data is also shared on this portal globally, and therefore it tells us uh, about uh, the uh, infections uh, that are happening and particularly the variants that are getting generated. So if you look at the number of variants that are getting generated are huge, although we don't know about them. If you look at this in UK itself, there are over 500,000 uh, mutations that have been reported, variants that have been reported. And uh, in India itself, we have over 22,000 variants that have been generated. Um, a few uh, in these variants, not all of them, of course, are variants of concerns, uh, which is what the WHO classifies these variants. So there are only so far four uh, variants of concerns classified by WHO, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Delta is the one which was first reported in India. And there are variants of interest, and currently WHO sees them as five, and these are listed on the right-hand side of the table. It also keeps a track on the variants which uh, uh, one should be, you know, keep all them on alert. And these are currently 12, including the C.1.2, uh, which is the South Africa variant. So these are currently uh, the variants which are generated. Uh, Now, what about India? Uh, the good thing that happened during this pandemic is that we also have a consortia where we are doing uh, genomic surveillance, which never happened earlier. And this is a joint effort of uh, DBT, ICMR, and CSIR. Uh, if you look at the data here, what we see is that the Delta variant particularly, if you see the graph here, uh, we started seeing it somewhere in March, and then that increased with in April, May, June, June and July. And, and this is currently till August, I have uh, shown you the data. And this coincides with the second peak. What it may, means is that uh, the second peak, what we got was primarily because of the generation of the Delta variant in India, and it circulated widely everywhere. Now, uh, are we seeing a new variant now? And the answer is, uh, uh, if you see here, the answer is that yes, we see a variant, a Delta Plus variant. And according to this uh, data, what we see in August uh, uh, data that there is a Delta Plus variant generation, which is AY.1. And this is a little bit more, and this is more so in the Kerala. Uh, if you see the data on IGIB, uh, you know, uh, portal, then you will see that this is what is, is getting generated. Globally, if you see whether the Delta variant has gone, the answer is yes, it's pretty much everywhere, and more so in the US, which is you see on the right hand side, and the Europe, and it's it has spread everywhere, if you see from this. The question is, uh, should we worried about the uh, AY.1 or any other variant? And the answer for this is that if we need to do this is we need to have a pan-India epidemiological surveillance and just doing sequencing is, is not going to be enough. Uh, we do have a very good consortia, but I looked at it and I looked at whether, whether we have the data 
on the, you know, are these variants more contagious, more severe, do they generate vector infection? We don't see this data. And unless we have this data, uh, sequencing all is going to tell us that we have a new variant and it will not tell us whether they, this variant is going to create a problem for us or for, you know, globally or not. And we'll have to rely, you know, wait for this data for a longer time then and wait for others. So something which I feel is that there should be a pan-India epidemiological surveillance. Now, uh, what happened, as we all know, that immunology came to rescue and we had many, many vaccines generated within a very record time uh, globally and India was not behind. As everyone talked about that Bharat Biotech, we had a vaccine, co-vaccine indigenously made and uh, the, they could do this because they were helped by the National Institute of Virology. We could provide them the strain Immediately they did that. So credit also goes to the NIV Pune in doing so. We also had a Serum Institute of uh, India, which is again a giant in terms of vaccine manufacturing, along with the Ox uh, Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine. They started manufacturing that and we had immediately got a COVID shield. Uh, the other major vaccines which we have are, of course, the Sputnik and Emana, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson Johnson, Oxford which they are making there, and uh, Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines. So these are the ones currently available. We soon we are going to have the Moderna in India and we're already getting Sputnik 5. Uh, this we already know, uh, do they provide protection in terms of reduction of infection and severity? Yes, uh, the data says that yes, it's uh, more than 90%. But what we see now is that there are breakthrough infections. We have seen this in India and globally. Uh, but what we see also that uh, uh, among the breakthrough infections, uh, this is a CDC data, the 10% uh, are getting need hospitalization and only 2% die, meaning that the vaccination does help. And uh, can Delta variant infect? Yes, Delta variant can infect even the vaccinated people. And pretty much there is no difference between people who are vaccinated and non-vaccinated. This is the US data. But what we see is that hospitalization is reduced and the deaths are very low. Now, this question, everybody, you know, we see a lot, uh, whether the third wave is going to be a bigger or more fatal. Uh, and a lot of people talked about this and I'm going to share my view uh, on this. And I'll let you decide yourself whether we are going to get third wave, whether it will be small or big. So first, let's all, let's look at what gives the uh, the wave in the first place. What gives us a wave, you know, that depends on the herd immunity and herd immunity, not just herd immunity per se, herd immunity against the circulating variant. This is important point is that what is circulating and do we really have immunity against that? The second, of course, the spread of infection. Are we taking enough containment measures? And can we contain the wave or not? If we are unable to do, and if there is a community transmission that starts happening, then we will get a wave. And again, the mutations, do we have? So even if we have immunity, do we have immune escape mutant? Uh, can they escape the immunity what we have? either partially or fully, and that would decide uh, the way. Now, if you look at uh, the Spanish flu, uh, you know, 1980 Spanish flu, a lot of fatality, almost huge number, uh, you know, close to 500 million. Uh, there we see that, you know, they were lasted almost two years and three peaks. The second peak was much larger. Can we learn anything? Why they, there was a second peak? So it's believed that the second peak is because of the mutation. There was a mutant that's what that started circulating and that was uh, more infectious. And therefore there was this, and also the troop movement during the second world war, there was a troop movement. So uh, because of that, there was this and the third wave was smaller. This is pretty much second wave similar to what we have in India. 
So now the question is, well, we have seen Delta variant. So what UK sees is the third wave, and third wave primarily is because of Delta variant. They have 90% cases uh, because a vaccine which they have cannot protect the infection, does protect the deaths though. Okay, so the third wave there is that is just because of Delta. We have already seen the Delta variant in India. Therefore, uh, getting a huge pick because of Delta is unlikely. What is the zero positivity? 67.6% zero positivity according to ICMR data. But does that translate into the herd immunity? The answer is no. The seropositive does not tell us whether the immune response generated is low or is high, is good enough to protect. All it tells us is that the person is infected with the virus. And therefore, mere looking at 67.6% seropositivity, we cannot assure ourselves that we have generated a herd immunity, which is normally talked about in the media. They normally translate the seropositivity into herd immunity, which is not correct. Now, what will decide the wave then? The wave will be decided, obviously, by the variant which will come, whether that variant particular have a high transmissibility can it transmit much better? And whether it can escape the immunity what we have already generated, and that will decide our wave. Can we predict which variant is going to generate? The answer is no. It's a random process, although there is a selection process into the play. So if anything, which goes out, and which survives in an individual, which has already immunity will be the one which can escape this immunity, okay? So we need to wait and watch and see which, which particular variants are getting generated and we'll have to wait. So it's very, very difficult. Nobody has a crystal ball to see and say that this is what is going to get generated and therefore wave is going to be a smaller or a bigger one. But what we know from this data for sure is that if we have a vaccination, the number of dates can be reduced. Now, there is another thing I would like to talk about is, is that the circulating uh, immune response. You know, uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, about that. I would like to talk about is that if once if we have infections, do we generate a good immune response or not? Yes, we do generate circulating immune uh, uh, antibodies. We do have, you know, uh, the uh, T cells generation, there are CD4 and CD8 type. We also have memory cells. These are all there. But if you look at this as a recent paper in science, the response varies a lot. Look at the, uh, the scale, uh, and on the y-axis, if you see, this is a log scale. So there is a huge difference in terms of the response that gets generated, and therefore, uh, and also we see that the response get reduced over a period of time. And more importantly, why we cannot say that whether the person is protected or not pro protected, because we do not have a correlate of protection yet. What, what does it mean by correlates of protection? It means that if I have X amount of antibody, then I will be protected. If I have X amount of the T cell, then I will be protected. If I have a memory still retained uh, uh, a certain amount, then I will, if I get a second infection, we'll get a triggered. And this is something we don't know. For example, in the influenza, we know that if the HI titer is 40, then they, it provides about protections to 50% of the individuals. No such correlates of protection we still have globally, and therefore it is very difficult to say that if we have a generated an immune response, whether that immune response is good enough or not good enough. Now, the next question is, do we really need a vaccine booster doses? But what should decide the vaccine boosters? 
the uh, reason should be that if the antibodies and T cells we have generated are reducing over a time, do we know the data? Do we have that data in India? The answer is no, we don't have it yet. Vaccine efficacy, uh, if it is reduced, for example, in even a compromised individuals, it varies from 59 to 72%. If the vaccine is not very effective, then these people certainly will need a booster. And this is what has been talked globally. A reduced protections against a particular variant. For example, now Delta is there in the Israel. And what they have found that if you give a booster dose, you can tame the Delta virus. And if that's the reason they have to give, have we seen the Delta variant? Yes, we have seen the Delta variant. Therefore, this should not be the reason for us to give the booster, but what we also know is that, you know, India has a lot of diabetic cases and are these people well protected? We need a data. We need data to see is that whether these protect people are producing, you know, good immune response or not, and, you know, protective immune response is there or not, and based on that, we will have to think about it. Uh, we have various protocols for mild, moderate, and severe. It has already been talked about. And there were very, so many trials which have been done by WH and others. What we see from there that in this V uh, in three randomized trials showed that it is pretty good, provide good protections to mild and severe cases. Although WHO solidar solidarity trial said that it has a little or no effect, but General belief is that remdesivir works in terms of monoclonal antibodies. We see is that it can provide 70% reduction uh, in hospitalization, uh, but only in end deaths, but only in the non-hospitalized patients. And steroids work, but as as it has been talked about, that steroids is good, but one needs to see uh, we have to give steroid and overuse is is not good. But what I want to bring a point here, which has already been talked about, is that we don't have no SARS-CoV-2 specific antiviral treatment yet. Uh, we thought that uh, remdesivir will work very well because if you do the in vitro assays, you you do uh, you know cell culture assay, put the virus infection, it works beautifully, and so is the hydroxychloroquine. But in patients, you know, it shows limited effect. Although three trials are there. But hydroxychloroquine, the data in terms of trial doesn't show that there is a good benefit uh, in, in patients. And this was there uh, during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. We had Tamiflu, we had the Lenza, and that turned out to be life-saving, and we didn't see so many deaths. Uh, is it here to stay? Uh, and I would like to say, I agree with most people, is that yes, it is likely to, likely to become endemic. So what are the factors that decide endemicity? Environmental effects on the viral stability. Is it stable? Yes, we have seen this wire, uh, virus even in summer. And humidity and heat did not prevent its spread. spread. Does it have a good transmission rate? The answer is again, yes. Can it generate immune escape mutants with a partial or full? The answer is again, yes. And all these are the factors which decide and therefore no reason to believe that it will not become endemic. Are there uh, other viruses, uh, coronaviruses, which are seasonal, for example? Yes, they, they are circulating and we have seen. Uh, the. What we have also seen is, is that the MERS is still containing, although the SARS-CoV, one which was there disappeared and we still don't understand. When the same question about endemicity was asked to all the scientists globally by nature survey, the overwhelming response was yes, 89% scientists believe that it will become uh, endemic and because of the reasons I talked about. So what is the way forward? Uh, We need a rapid COVID-19 uh, scanning test, particularly, you know, at the airport or wherever we have people coming from outside. Uh, apart from genomic surveillance, we need epidemiological surveillance if you have to really understand what, you know, 
variants are and what to do next. A uh, specific treatment is still missing, although massive efforts are going on in this direction. Uh, vaccination uh, for all and boosters to immunocompromised people. Vaccines against the variant. So now if we, uh, you know, Delta is partially, uh, uh, you know, works, the vaccines work against Delta partially only. But if we get eventually the variants where the vaccines do not work, but because uh, remember one thing is that these vaccines are against the original virus we have made and not against the variants and therefore we may have to make the vaccines against the variants in future. And the lastly, if it, if it becomes endemic, then we will have to prepare for annual vaccination as we do for the influenza. Thank you very much and I would like to stop here. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing your time and giving very useful information on COVID-19 pandemic and the way forward to fight against the virus. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, COVID-19 pandemic is having profound effects on children's mental health, their safety, their social development, economic uh, security, and beyond. Thank so, you, ma'am. And all these is having multiple uh, problems. The children are facing multiple problems with these side effects. We have with us Dr. Sanjandita Patiji, who will be speaking on COVID-19 and children, current situation and way forward. Dr. Sanjandita Ji is the director of ICMR RMRC Bhumeshwar. She is a fellow of Union for International Cancer Control and International College of Nutrition and currently the senior non visiting fellow of Harvard School of Public Health. She is a recipient of several awards, including the Early Career Award from International Society of Behavioral Medicine, Arya Women Achiever Award in the year 2017, Samantha Chandrasekhar Award in the year 2018 in Life Sciences category by Udisha Vigyan Academy. We request, request you, ma'am, to please share your thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Going to share your slides, ma'am. Sorry. Over to you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. I think I was yes. myself. Yes, yes. First of all, yes. thank yes. you again. Yes. And uh, thanks for sharing my slides because <clears throat> uh, to avoid uh, last minute any technical glitch, I share this with you. And my special thanks to Manjusama, ma'am, for making me a part of this Jagrupta Avian. And we are also a part of the NASI ICMR. Uh, COVID-19 third wave awareness initiative. So I was also sharing few slides on that as well. So when uh, I got the mail from Professor Mishra sir that what I should be speaking on and why I looked at the galaxy of speakers. So I thought that I will limit myself more about the future or the, what is the current situation in terms of COVID-19 in pediatric age group because much uh, discussions, much conversations are happening around this. Should we reopen the school or should we not? Should we give vaccine to our children or should we not? And every one of us being a parent are very much concerned about our children and also the country itself is concerned about its future generation. And it's a very uh, difficult decision to make how to go about it. And before that, what does the data tell us? What is the point is the compass pointing to? So I'll be speaking more on public health aspects because I know lunch is nearing and so very, because looking at or uh, listening to all the eminent speakers, so I will keep it little light and more dialogues around the public health aspects of pediatric COVID 
what does the data indicate and what should be the next step yeah next slide please. next slide Okay, so basically a little bit about RMRC Bhubaneswar, as all of uh, I mean all of you know, this is uh, one of the institutes of ICMR Bhubaneswar and uh, ICMR at Bhubaneswar, and we completed 40 years. So before I move to pediatric COVID, uh, I would like to highlight our findings on a systematic review. And in fact, we did a systematic review to find out what are the challenges in maternal and child health service delivery and access during pandemics because every one of us is very much aware that whenever there is any catastrophe whenever there is any disaster the most vulnerable are our mother and children particularly under five age group so keeping that in view we try to find out is it only in india or is it a pan lmic phenomenon so we did a very quick systematic review and we identify try to identify what has been the challenges in delivering and not only supply side but also in the access side or in the demand side in availing both maternal and child health services during a pandemic next so what we found is that when we look at the child health services particularly these were the dimensions that have been reported to be affected which includes immunization doctor consultation transportation to your facility then availability of drugs and consumables like injections and like ORS, then diagnostic services, and most importantly is when a child needs admission. And when we looked at the different studies and we divided them into pandemics versus disaster, disasters like cyclone, flood, and earthquake, and Odisha is one of the most disaster-prone states, so also Bangladesh, our neighboring country. So when we looked at all the LMIC country, we found that you see the availability particularly doctor consultation is very much challenges i mean very much reported similarly transportation similarly drugs and consumable at the same time like acceptability and affordability has not been explored more not that there was no challenge but it was not explored by those studies so these kind of this systematic review points one thing is that during pandemic as well as disaster there was disruption in child health services access as well as delivery so next and what were the major challenges we found particularly in terms of child health services when we look at the right side like vaccines immunization program everywhere had a little setback because of not only the stock but also delayed arrival but also storage and there were some free services which could not be paid i mean which they had to pay the uh, users have to pay for free services in some countries and most importantly which was affected is sick child care the ideal which is very minor which can be easily treated but during pandemic during catastrophe it is found that they become a cause of death we should not be in normal circumstances and the second thing is very important is that psychological spread trauma because no child is, ex is experienced or exposed to such kind of long stay at home and such kind of uh, iso getting isolated from their own friends and this is a very unprecedented situation for all the young children and poor accessibility and and what usually they have been doing is that even if there is a sickness mainly parents avail treatment from nearby small pharmacies or medicine shops or over the counter prescription and there is uh, there has been reports of shortage of drugs and of course nutrition is something that has been affected because of the availability at the same time affordability because many livelihood was also affected mm -hmm. during a pandemic yes and mm -hmm. next so what uh, uh, the systematic review pointed is that there has been whenever there has been any pandemic there has been increased 9 to 18 percent rise or increase in children's acute illness seven percent increase in the prevalence of malnutrition or undernutrition while 18 percent reduction in full immunization so whenever we are thinking whenever we are not addressing a pandemic at the same time child health services do get affected and what normally countries have done they have organized a mass vaccination campaign or we, we call it a catch-up campaign when the uh, pandemic slowly recedes so a catch-up campaign has been one of the uh, remedial measures a remedial strategy 
to address this kind of loss in immunization. Next. So now comes the most important question, COVID-19 in children. So where do we stand and where do we go forward? And let us look at a little bit about the data. What does the different data indicate? Next man. So that has been a very recent uh, one systematic review wherein they have looked at what exactly pediatric COVID-19 says, and they uh, they pulled most of the reports that have looked at pediatric COVID-19, and those studies shows that children might be asymptomatic carriers of the virus and may be involved in the transmission, and it also suggests that there are unilateral CT scan chest findings also in 36% of pediatric COVID-19 patients. So this is very important whenever any physicians or any pediatricians are treating patients when they have cough. And as already rightly pointed out by all my previous speakers that hand washing and COVID-19 preventive behaviors are extremely important when we are taking care of pediatric population, particularly to those immunocompromised children or malnourished children or who have pneumonia so that they are not exposed to COVID-19. Next. So what did this systematic review? Another systematic review, which looked at the clinical characteristics, treatment, and outcomes of pediatric COVID-19, found out that when we looked at the different uh, symptoms, when like comorbidity, fever, cough, and similarly vomiting was less, at the same time, dyspnea was also less. So when you look at these are the different symptoms or clinical symptoms that have been reported in pediatric age group, which starts from fever to gingivitis. And in fact, some have reported pharyngeal erythema. But at the same time, if you see, around 1,100 out of 6,000 were, were asymptomatic. So even though we speak a lot about Kawasaki shock, it was less. Yeah. Now coming to the clinical management, what, do, what does this systematic review show? I mean, clinical management mostly have been around antibiotics and steroids and antivirals, ventilation growth is less. And infant, as already told by hydroxychloroquine, was going on aspirin, interferon, and some also traditional medicine in some parts of the world. And when we look at the clinical outcome, we see that recovered is 8,700 out of 9,335, while ICU admission was 1350 and death was 96. So out of 6,900 uh, cases that were pulled, 96 deaths were reported in pediatric COVID-19. Next slide. So when we compare between non-severe versus severe, if we look at the ICU recovered and death, in case of non-severe cases, ICU is almost nil or recovery is much more, while death is less around one, while at the same time, severe cases, this is little higher. But when we compare with adults, definitely the severity and the outcome is lesser compared to the adults in pediatric age group. Yes. Next slide. So this review suggests that children usually predominantly contracted mild form of infection, but could be at risk of more severe outcomes. It cannot be completely complacent or relaxed. So it has to be a cautious approach, but at the same time, it may not be that stringent restrictions. And at the same time, it is also important to take into consideration of various risk factors which are important for pediatric COVID outcomes, comprising contact exposure, underlying comorbidities, age of the child. And in fact, it has been found that male children are more affected in the risk. And particularly where there is resource constraint, that is countries like low and middle income settings, there is much need, much I mean, requirement or need for closer scrutiny when we look when we look at in the global context because all of us are very well aware about the resource constraint overcrowding and household congestion in low and middle income countries compared to high income settings next slide so let, now let us see india case what does our own data so in terms of pediatric covid uh, both first wave as well as second wave as i mean apprehended or has been um, were proposed by many uh, media or many people that maybe second wave has affected more pediatric age group and third wave, third wave might affect even more. But when we see, when we compare the proportion, we do not see much difference. 
between the proportion of pediatric age group between first wave versus the second wave. Next. So now we at RMRC group measure because we are the, uh, I mean, premier lab in Odisha and we were the first lab to start COVID-19 testing. So what we did, we did our own data analysis. And when we looked at below 18 years and 18 years and above, the positivity in below 18 years was 11%, while those who were above 18 years, it was 13.78%. Next. And when we broke more, in fact, when we segregated into zero to five years and six to nine years, 10 to 17 years and 18 years and above, as you can see that zero to five years, the positivity was 9%, while it became six to nine years, 12.9 and 10 to 17 when you mix both then it is 11.9% and 18 years above, if you see, again, it is more. Next. And when we looked at male versus female, uh, the positivity rate, as you can see, females have got little lesser positivity compared to male children. Next. Next slide. So what we did, we also analyzed uh, from this 20 to 21, looking at the monthly positivity rate during various months in various age groups. So when we see, if you see these graphs, you can see that whenever adult positivity goes up, commensurately the pediatric COVID positivity goes up. That means whenever the pandemic transmission is active, it affects adults and pediatric age group equally. That does not mean that pediatric age group has a differentially higher risk of getting affected. So they are always affected based on the transmission dynamics prevailing at that time. Next slide. So when we see this cumulative number of confirmed cases by age group or by the, in the pediatric age group, you see the epidemic form. So as you can see that the pack of zero to five years, six to nine and 10 to 17 years, 10 to 17 years comprise a much higher proportion when compared to zero to five years. Next. So now let us look at the national zero survey. What does the zero survey findings reveal in terms of pediatric COVID? So what we found is that children, even when confined to home, developed COVID uh, infection because they were zero positive, in fact, nearly at the same rate as that of adults. So let us have a quick look at the first, second, third, and fourth wave. So what does the second wave show? I mean, if we see the second wave, uh, 10 to 17 and uh, years versus 18 to 44, 45 to 60 and more than 60. So at that time, in the second wave, if you see 18 to 44 were the participants. And when we look at the zero prevalence, if you see the zero prevalence, that is overall zero prevalence versus the age group zero prevalence, 10 to 17, 18 to 44 and 45 to 60, you can see 5.4, 6.9, 6.5, 6.2. It's not a very grossly different zero prevalence between the different age groups. This is the second zero wave, zero third wave. Next slide, please. And when we look at the third zero survey, 10 to 17 and 18 to 44 and 45 to 60, again, if you see, I mean, in fact, 10 to 17 years, the zero prevalence was more compared to 18 to uh, 44 years. So what we can see is that pediatric age group have been remaining exposed at the same rate as that of the adults. Let us see to the, the fourth round, wherein we also included six to 10 years for the first time. Next slide. So what happened is the fourth national zero survey. In fact, we did we also did zero survey of these three states, uh, Odisha, Jharkhand, and Chhattisgarh, apart from the national zero survey. So when we see it, six to nine year versus 10 to 17 and 18 to 44, if we see those six to nine is less than 60, but it's not very grossly lower compared to the counterparts of 10 to 17 or 18 to 44 years. And the same, same if you see the same uh, percentage, that is uh, 6 to 9 versus 10 to 17. So those 6 to 19, 9 is less, but it is at least at par with the adult zero survey. Next. And we should not forget that those who are more than 60, they were vaccinated. That could be also the increased zero prevalence in that age group. While the children were not vaccinated, that also we have to bear in mind while interpreting the zero survey findings. Now comes the most important discussion. Should we now think of reopening the schools? How do we balance? So there was a very uh, interesting article 
where it was mentioned that when we are planning to reopen the school, we must balance, as already told by Dr. Priya Abraham, that COVID-19 has taught us uncertainty and at the same time simplicity. So we must keep in mind the uncertainty of the third wave or the uncertainty of the variant. I mean, there, is, there are still a lot of uh, uncertainties circulating around and risks. At the same time, we have to do also look at the harms that we are giving to our children with a prolonged closure. So how do we strike a judicious balance between the risk and the benefit? Should we open the school? Should we allow our children to have resume their normal life? I mean, the, the psychological trauma, the loss in uh, intellectual development, vis-a-vis -vis the risk to exposure to COVID-19 and get it infected. So how do we go about it? Next. So what uh, mostly it has been told is that we, if we have to reopen the schools when we are planning for normalcy, we must keep few strategies or few protocols in hand when we think of reopening first reopening schools in a staged fashion, not opening all the schools at the same time. Maybe we can think of a staggering like primary, secondary, and then maybe high school. And then second is definitely social distancing, but that might be a challenge because every school has got a very defined classroom. So should we think of open school? Should we think of open space school? So what should we do about it? And third is how do we have a school-based surveillance system which informs we can go for a pooled saliva testing. And here the role of quick testing comes into play and pooled testing comes into play because getting swabs from children can be, can be a little tricky. So how do we have user-friendly testing for our children? That has to be one kind of, uh, that has to be next innovation or next thought. And fourth is very important. We have to protect our teachers already. They have been vaccinated and also identifying those two children who are vulnerable in terms of their immunodeficiency or malnutrition or other comorbidities. And fifth is that constant monitoring and identifying newer techniques, like for example, can we think of um, you know, urban space, school space design? What, what were the different innovations we can think of? Next. So UNICEF has given this uh, uh, framework for reopening schools that prior to reopening, we should be ready with our policies, procedures, and guidelines and standard operating procedures and part of reopening process and with schools reopen. So this is a three-phase system. It's not that we straight away go and reopen the schools. Before the schools are opened, we must be ready with our protocol and also our infrastructure and also our logistics ready. And second, water sanitation. Most of the schools may not be having basic toilets, basic water, potable water supply. So in that situation, how do we maintain water and sanitation? How do we tell them hand washing? So these kind of logistics, this kind of system should be in place before we think of reopening, but particularly the schools located in the rural and remote areas. And third is when the schools reopen, constant monitoring for health indicators. And at the same time, how do we, uh, my suggestion, would also be, I mean, everybody is suggesting that we should not back up, I mean, depend only on offline teaching. There has to be a parallel blended teaching approach should go on so that system should not collapse whenever there is any pandemic. I mean, there should be always a backup plan or a plan B in place that if there is any disruption in the school activity, student can switch on to digital teaching. So these kind of innovations should run in parallel so that to avoid the sudden collapse of sudden uh, setback to schooling. Next. Next. So these are the few, as I already told, that reopen schools in a stage fashion, then incorporate social and physical distancing, ensure infection control measures, including contact tracing, protect teachers, and of course, research and evaluation. Next. And very recently, in fact, yesterday, the Indian Association of Social and Preventive Medicine have given this, uh, this kind of a advisory that now the schools should start to reopen with primary schools. And since children have already been protected because of the zero positivity, we may think of reopening the school, but at the same time, we cannot lower our guards with all the safeguards in place. 
and this is the advisory which has been released by Indian Association of Preventive and Social Medicine, NCO of School Preparedness, optimize school attendance, maybe 50% or 40% to start with. Every school has to design its own optimization process. Then every, maybe we can think of including COVID appropriate behavior in our curriculum, in our school curriculum, not only teachers education, but also school curriculum. So training on COVID appropriate behavior, students are trained, some of them can act as change agent or peer leaders and vaccinations of teachers and staff. Then teachers may be trained because there is a RBSK, Rashtriya Bal Swasthya Karyakram, where the teachers are trained not only to identify visual defect, to identify any kind of uh, congenital anomaly, any kind of uh, intellectual deficit in their children. Similarly, teachers can be trained to identify respiratory symptoms early and students should be encouraged to declare self-declaration of symptoms and there should be always some kind of counseling services available and child health, RBSK or child school health services must go hand in hand with COVID-19 prevention. Next. So with this respect, because already Manjushan ma'am had told, the RMRC Bhupneshwar has been involved in this uh, NASI COVID-19 awareness initiative in tribal Odisha. So what we have done is that in Sadri language, that's a tribal language, in the Sadri language, we have uh, made a video wherein we have students, young children are, I mean, kind of advising other children to follow COVID-19 appropriate behavior. And that is every village, every district has got this national health missions. Uh, uh, I mean, this is, this is called COVID chariot, wherein they spread this, this uh, truck moves around through villages. And therein we have played that video so that the village and the uh, tribal children they see and they learn how to follow COVID-19 appropriate behavior. Next. So that's the YouTube. I mean, I have shared the link where you children have acted in this video. And if you want, you can just let a little bit, I mean, just move if you want. And that's the video. Maybe, uh, I mean, you can always watch it and it's available on YouTube, uh, wherein a young ch uh, child is singing and enact being enacted by all the young children for since the schools are going to reopen or for all the children how to follow COVID-19 appropriate behavior. And it's in tribal language. The whole song is in tribal language. That is the Sadri language, which is the local dialect of Sundargarh district. And it has been very well accepted by young children because they see their peers performing and advising them what to do, what not to do. So this kind of awareness initiatives can always be thought upon where children telling their own peers. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude. I, I must give my acknowledgement to this Jagrupta Abhiyan and Manjushana ma'am and the Abhinar organizing team as well as DC Mishrasar and my own colleagues. And my salute to all involved in this Jagrupta Abhiyan because each one of us is a true COVID warrior. Thank you. Thank you so much ma'am for sharing this very useful information. And you have rightly said that we need to protect our children also and for that we need to follow the advisories and all the protocols of covid appropriate behavior thank you so much for sparing your time and with this we come to the end of this webinar may i now request uh, professor gc mishra sir to say a few words sir would you like to con uh, conclude uh, yeah Am I audible? Yes, sir. Excellent talk. Very well received. Simple, but with a straightforward message. That was the purpose of this seminar. Dr. Professor Kambos gave such an excellent talk on vegetation, vaccine hesitancy that I'm really moved, although there was interruption in the slides. Dr. Sahu, a straightforward message that what should be done, what is possible, 
with the very clear cut messages. Just now, Dr. Pati, children care has been major concern globally for parents, for society. I hope after listening her talk, children will be little bit more cared by their parents. Maybe society will also chip in something. Talk by Dr. Sina Ames. We all don't know the really any medicine works. But we all believe the treatment given by doctor hopefully will save us. Very elegantly, taking case by case, he described what kind of treatment should be given. And I think that will also go a long way for general practitioners, for the people who are caring COVID patients, that how really one should treat. When to give steroids, when not to give steroids. What steroids are going to cause, what they are not going to cause. Dr. Sanjay Singh. Hello. Dr. Sanjay Singh. The only mRNA vaccine made by this country. I have monitored the program very carefully because I'm the board member of their company. So progress is presented every three months to the board members and monitored. Very cautious, very careful, and against tremendous odds, nationally and internationally. I must congratulate Sanjay Singh for succeeding to the level he is, that is, going to phase two and third trials. Wonderful efforts. Dr. P. Abraham, the first speaker, etiquettes about corona, yeah, corona appropriate behavior. See, clearly emphasize that we don't have much options except the three that is sanitization, hand washing, and champion of all mask. I hope the message has gone to the people. Even in why walk, walk in the morning, most of the time my mask is below my nose. Hopefully after listening her, I will also be sensible enough to keep mask above nose. Finally, thank you all for coming to listening the talk. And I think it was very well organized, very well done. Initially, I was hesitant, but Madam Sarma, the main mover behind it. In fact, she is the one who selected the speaker, not G.C. Misra. She called me, gave me the list, and told me, try to contact them. All the selection of speakers is done by Dr. Madam Sharma. Her commitment to the cause is beyond imaginations. Hopefully, I will also have some message from her that my sincerity or my commitment should also be at least much more than what I do in for society. So thank you all for listening. Once again, many, many thanks. It's over from my side. Thank you so much, sir, for very 
uh, nicely precising the entire uh, proceedings of this event. And now I would like to uh, express gratitude to all who have contributed to the successful organization of this event. As we all know, the Jagrupta Abhiyan for COVID-19 pandemic was initiated under the chairmanship of Honorable Madam Dr. Manju Sharma ji, who made concerted efforts to implement this program. So first and foremost, I would like to express my profound gratitude to her and on behalf of Nasi and my own behalf, we are very much thankful to her for all her efforts and for her major contribution towards this program. And thank you so much, ma'am, for sparing your time and providing your valuable guidance and we look forward to our kind blessings as always. We had a very informative talk uh, shared by Honorable Professor Padmanathan sir, the past president of NASI. We are very much thankful to him and for his major contributions to NASI's activities and uh, for delivering a very informative talk. Thank you so much, sir. We are honored by Honorable Professor V.P. Kambo sir, the past president of NASI, who uh, uh, contributed a lot to the NASI's activities and, and, uh, and every webinar, Jagupta webinar, he delivered his lectures and to enlighten the masses. So on behalf of NASI, we heartily thank him for sparing his time and being with us. Thank you so much, sir. We also had very distinguished speakers from all across the country. Uh, Professor Priya Brahm, ma'am, Dr. Sanjay Singh, sir, Dr. Sanjeev Sinha, sir, Dr. Arvind Sahu, sir, Dr. Sangamitra Pati, ma'am. We are very much thankful to all for uh, accepting our kind invitation, sparing their time, and sharing their expertise on very important aspects of COVID-19 pandemic and we look forward to their continued support in future also. On behalf of NASI and my own behalf, I express my sincere thanks to Honorable Professor G.C. Mishra sir and his team, who is the chairman of uh, NASI Pune chapter, who are working so hard to make this event a grand success. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, we uh, thank you uh, very much for your kind efforts and coordinating the speakers who make this event a grand success. And we are thankful to Dr. Varni sir also for his contribution and support. We would like to express our sincere thanks to all the participants for their uh, support and who joined us with their great enthusiasm. And now I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the past presidents of NASI, NASI fellows, members, and local chapters for rendering their kind support and contribution whenever and wherever required. I also place on record my sincere thanks to our general secretaries, both the general secretaries and treasurer of NASI for all their help and support. We are also joined by several other dignitaries here, Professor Seth sir, Professor Chandima Sah, Madam, the Honorable President of INSA, Dr. Subha Chakravarti, Ma'am, Dr. Suchita Banerjee, Ma'am, Dr. R. D. Tripathi, Sir, and Dr. Debashish Mishra, Sir. So NASI expresses its sincere thanks to everyone for being with us and sparing their time. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to place on record my sincere thanks to all the executives and staff of NASI for all their kind help and support to make this event a grand success. I once again thank everyone. Sir, we can now close the meeting? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you all.